This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, good morning, and a very warm welcome to all of you joining us once again on a very beautiful but rather cool morning in Juma in the Sabi Sands. It is 17 degrees Celsius, 71 degrees Fahrenheit, and it is a glorious day to start off with a female leopard. Welcome again. My name is Steve Falkenridge, and I'm joined once again on camera by Senzo Mkise with the Three Finger Magician. And we are out, and we've managed to find the, the small Shadulu female from yesterday. First thing you do in the morning is go check where you last had your cats, and from there, move on. So um, I'm out again this morning with Brent, who will be on Bushwalk with Herbie, as well as Taylor, who's out on Game Drive and assisting in all sorts of wonderful activities this morning. Please feel free to send your questions through at hashtag Safari Live or follow us on the YouTube stream. Let's go back over to the beautiful and gorgeous Shadulu female. It's always marvelous being able to come out Always wonderful being able to come out and just to find this young leopard in the same place she was, except for the fact that she was in the tree feeding on a dacre. And what we still have in the tree is the same dacre, looking a little bit less, uh, a little bit low on the body weight situation, as it's, it's still poised up in the tree. We're not in the best position right now to see it, because we've come in and she's on the ground, exactly where we should be parking to see the dacre in the tree, but she is awake she's alert she got up a few moments ago to see something in the bushes and then lay down again so nothing too exciting but it's a rather cool morning and we had potential of some rain last night but there was no rain but temperatures are marvelous this morning and posing to be a beautiful beautiful morning in the african savannah last night we had this female as i said up the tree scott found her yesterday morning or should I say, I found her with uh, Herbie and Craig yesterday morning on foot. And Scotty D managed to follow her all the way to where we are now. And she found a dacre somehow in the long grass. Managed to snatch it from a hyena. Quickly uh, pulled it up the tree. And then we spent the afternoon watching her feed. It was absolutely marvelous. She's a very relaxed young female. We don't know too much about her. We believe she spends a lot of her time in the West but we'll be with her for a little while and see what it is she gets up to. But let's go to Brent and the Bushwalk team and see what they're going to be up to this morning. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to another splendid day in the Sabi Sand, South Africa. My name is Brent Deersmith. I have Dangerous Dave, the objectified dish, on camera with me. And, of course, great to be back with Herbie on foot. Herbie. There we go. So very excited to be on my first Bushwalk since I've been back. Uh, unfortunately, I got quite a bit of news from my brother last night. Hasana left the property. Tamba left the property. Tandi and Cub, we tracked her off the property this uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, so we're not going to go march around looking for leopards. We're going to see if we can find some of the smaller things, flowers, bugs. And there's a bigger thing, wildebeest. Now, I'm surprised they haven't started snorting at us yet. They are known to <laughs> when they do see you on foot. So quite often uh, after dark, the herd of wildebeest moves up onto quarantine where it's open and there's less chance they can be snacked by lions. Now, I didn't hear any lions last night at all, which I uh, was hoping maybe we might hear some lions. Maybe the Nkahumas are coming back now that the Evoca males have headed back towards the Manuleti, but alas, no luck. But we're going to head down towards the, the dam, um, have a look what tracks, what flowers we can find. Not too many flowers due to the, the little bit of rain we've had this year. And uh, then maybe head up the Moati uh, towards Galago and see what wonders we can find around the drainage lines or river systems. So while I stroll through the bush, and enjoy myself thoroughly. Let's go see what the very loud and not so green, or maybe she's still got a bit of green in her hair, Taylor McCurdy is that to you. <laughs> I do have a little bit of green brain to you. Kind of caught me out there. The only place that I could not remove 
the paint was from my hair, which will be done today. Good morning, everybody. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on with me is Craig, and we are freezing. Well, I am. I don't know why I thought it was a good idea to wear shorts out on the safari this morning, because it's quite chilly. Anyways, we will deal with that a little bit later. Hopefully, the sun will burn through. And we'll burn through some of the clouds. Not all of them, though, oh, because we uh, we like the clouds, so we can have a nice, cool day. Look who we've got. Good morning, guinea fowl. How fitting. Isn't that just so fantastic, seeing as though we spent so much time with them yesterday? There they all are. And they're making noises, too. Running and making noises, just like guinea fowl normally do. Panicking. Which way do we go? Which way do we go? Not going to the dam today, though. They are clucking a little bit, too. Is, oh, we wanted to see Dylan. Ah, we'll have to catch Dylan on camera at some point. We'll get him, don't worry. We'll get him. I know you were all dying to see Dylan yesterday. So we'll get there at some point. Can you fall? What are you making noises for? Very chatty this morning, the guinea fowl in the long grass. You can barely see them. Isn't that a cool sound? I'm quite fond of the sound of guinea fowl. Now, Sandor, you've asked for crocodiles today. We shall try our best, see if we can find Vladimir, Boris, or perhaps Snappy down at Chitwa Dam, because that's where we are. We are on Chitwa. Yesterday we were discussing what guinea fowl eat. Now, I know they have disappeared behind a fallen silver cluster leaf, but we were talking about how they're feasting on grass seeds at the moment. And here you go, you can actually see them. Look, they're looking for the juiciest seed, pecking away, stretching their heads up high. It's like they're all rallying one another. Right, guys, let's get this day going. Let's eat all the food. Go, go, go. I actually don't know what they're saying because I don't speak guinea fowl. And off they go. <laughs> Why are you guys going so crazy? I don't know what's wrong with them. What are they doing? So we we're going to leave and then now they're still... I don't know why they're chatting like this. I mean, they're not alarming. You can see there's nothing that looks like... Well, it doesn't look like these getting fella frightened whatsoever. Oh, that one just flew out of the grass. Okay, bye. Apparently they don't want to be on camera today. That's all right. Fine. Bye, guinea fowl. I'm um, just trying to think now. Dylan has just come out of this road. Do we want to go back around that way, though? Yes. Later. We'll go over the dam wall and do a couple of laps around Chitwa Lodge to see if Tingana came out. Because that's our plan this morning, is to have a little look around to see if we can finish the story of Tingana yesterday. Seeing as though he just, you know, very rudely disappeared into the camp and we couldn't follow him, which is a little bit sad. But hopefully we can get him again. And yesterday was so windy and the wind did stop at quite late last night. So if he has gone wandering, ab uh, wandering about, sort of between when we left him and early hours of this morning, hopefully those tracks will be nice and fresh and easy to read in the sand, because they can always be a little bit on the tricky side when the wind has been blowing about. So I'll check here as well. The leopards love to walk around here, down and up and down this road. Also just checking the big marula trees, plenty of big marula trees around Chitwa Open. Who's going t t t t t t t now, as well, there's another bird. They're all charting. All oh, fish eagles are going. It's all very exciting. You know what? That little bird is going to be so small to try and see. We'll just pretend we didn't hear it. We'll carry on. I don't know what's making that noise. Now, Brenda, seen as though we've been uh, having a foul fest since yesterday afternoon, you're wondering, do you... Is there one guinea fowl that looks out for the rest? Well, I suppose when you live in a flock, they're fairly social guinea fowl. And uh, yes, they will look off after one another. So when I say that, keep an eye on each other. Um, <clears throat> they're constantly looking around. And if one does give a bit of an alarm call, you almost see a reaction from the others immediately. Hello? There's one up there, Craig. I don't know if it's going to fly, though. This is my favorite, is seeing guinea fowl up high. Also, clucking away is quite nice. They make a great wallpaper. The silhouetted guinea. 
with a leopard orchid and a leadwood tree. Bye bye. Off it goes. Ooh, good morning, Lady Starfire. How's it going? How's uh, Ben and Tesla today? Are they well? Hope they're well. I suppose they're going to bed just now. Anyways, you were wondering how many chicks do guinea fowl normally have? Mm, is it? I'm just trying to think of how many eggs they can lay. I'd imagine it's quite a few. I'm going to busk here quickly. I'm going to say they must have between six and twelve eggs. I, d I actually don't know. Somewhere around there'd be a lot. But look. The guinea fowl are also around, but that's not what we're going to look at now. We've got the hippos. Hello, hippos. Quite a big pod, too. Hey, we're getting some good sounds this morning. That's quite nice. All the animals are very chatty, and those two little hippos are mouthing one another, gumming one another. There's no teeth there. Off they go, playing around while the animals have already gone to sleep. That's quite funny, in fact. <laughs> Little ones, of course, running around while the adults just want a bit of peace and quiet. I bet it sounds familiar to all the parents out there. So off you go, back across to Steve. Shidulu is on the move. Yes, she did the characteristic yawn. And then a second yawn, and then I counted to five, ladies and gentlemen. And she stood up. She looks up at her sun-dried dacre, and uh, she's now moved into the thicket. So I'm wondering if she's going to go up the tree, <clears throat> stand by and watch with us, and let's see if she does show us how agile. Here we go. Ah, oh, fantastic. Isn't that magical to watch a leopard go up a tree? I find that, always find that really magical. Could you hear the claws on the tree there? Very strong, very powerful. <clears throat> Good morning, Nancy. You want to know if I know how old she is? Ah, oh, look at that. I don't actually, Nancy. I, I think Brent might know. We were having a little chat about where she comes from last night, him and myself. Maybe those of you who are watching who know our leopards intimately will be able to tell me where or how old she is. I know she comes from the Ottawa area in the Sabi Sands, which is just north of the Singita property. From Ingrid Dam, she is the female, or the youngster of the Ingrid Dam female. And that is as much as I got last night out of Brent, but I didn't actually ask him the age. So I wonder if those of you watching who've seen her before, I'm pretty sure some people will know exactly how old she is. And she is back to exactly the same behavior she was last night when we left. Thanks for waiting for us, young lady. Kendra is sending through the information that she's about three and a half years. Thank you, Kendra. That is a marvelous age for a young leopard. She's kind of coming to breeding now, and it would be marvelous if she decides to stay here on the western side of Juma. It definitely seems to be a, a bit of a spot available for a young female leopard in this area. With Tunny doing a thing on what is our eastern side now, it's definitely a big gap here on the west. And this is an area Hukumuri likes to move through, so if she does stay, I'm sure he will come and find her. Trimboard would like to know what the most active early morning animals are, and that is a very good question. Essentially, what we would call now, this is the early morning, but you could also call it the dawn, and we could go and we could look at the dusk. So the dusk and the dawn, if you put those together, it's a term called crepuscular, and there are a lot of animals that are active sort of during the early hours and the late hours, so the dusk and the dawn time of the day, and honey badgers, leopards, lions... Hyena, this is kind of the time of day when it's still cool enough for them to be moving around, but it really depends on what is going on out there. For example, this female was probably feeding for a good portion of the night, then she probably slept exactly where we found her for a very good portion of the night, and now, because she's got the meat up there, she has just been relaxing, and now it's time, obviously because the camera's are on her now, she's now gone up to give a, a little cameo performance. But multitudes of animals are active during the sort of cooler times of the day. This is when all the birds are waking up. 
although it is pretty quiet where we are now. It's the time of day when the dawn is starting and the day is coming into activity and a lot of your nocturnal animals will be going to sleep and a lot of your daytime animals will be sort of waking up. So it's kind of that like switch over between the night and the day. So anything could happen this time of day. It's hence why we do game drives at this time and in the afternoon. So I hope that kind of answers your question. How's your view there, Sense? You want me to go back a bit? Okay, we're just going to move back a couple of meters, see if we can get a little bit of a better look at her. We are in the sighting on our own. And while we do that, let's go and see what Brent is up to on his bushwalk. I'm sure he's super excited to be back on foot. I'm still searching for flowers, and as I said, with the lack of rain we've had this year, a lot of the flowers haven't popped out. So we're now heading down towards the Mawahi, uh, the little river system that runs through the heart of Juma, uh, to see if we can find something there. Before then, we're going to pop off a chili pan. Dave, you're going to fall over some elephant dung. Uh, <laughs> see, I love this. You know what you must do to cameramen when they're walking like this? You walk faster, and then they've got to keep walking. Come on, Dave. Move, Dave. Move, Dave. It's very funny when you start walking faster, and you can just see it in their faces. Slow down. Slow down. <laughs> Uh, I, I, <laughs> sorry about that. It's just really nice to be out. Oh, sorry, next, can you send that again? My earpiece popped out while I was tormenting David. <laughs> Sandor is wondering what is the best season for safari. Now, all year is very good. It depends what you want. Summer months, birds, it's beautiful and green, there's water about. Uh, but for me, if you're only going to come on sort of one safari in your life, the best time is uh, sort of the end of October, beginning of September. It's just before the first rains arrive. It is very hot, but it is very dry. That means the animals are concentrated on water points. Um, there's a lot of interaction between the different predators. There's a lot of hunting uh, behavior. So that's why I like that time of the year the most personally, because um, you've got to see a lot of action. So. You've got lots of elephants around drinking at the water holes that are left. You've got lions, buffalo, um, wild dogs, everything sort of kicking off. What was that I heard? Let's just take a moment and listen. It's so, so lovely to hear the dawn chorus. We've got... And I can hear at least at least 15 or 16 different species of bird. Some of them sound quite lovely, others like, otherwise unlike, uh, some of them like the virtual starling, Black. not so pretty. Ooh. Hello, knob thorn. Now, this poor knob thorn is in trouble. Now quite often this is how a lot of the bigger trees in this area come to be an end. So you can see an elephant is stripped off uh, the a lot of the the bark and the cambium layer and what happens when elephants do that so the bark is a protective layer for the for a lot of the trees but once it's been stripped off it makes it a lot easier for the wood borers to get in. And you can see we've got some little holes here uh, and those are wood borer beetles. Um, it could even be a click beetle. Now, what happens is, because the bark's not there and it's not getting any uh, moisture as well from the ground, um, the, the wood dries out. You can hear how dry it is when I knock on it. It sounds like you're knocking on it. Anyone a term? Oh dear, tree, you're going to die. Um, so what happens is, this tree is still alive at the moment, but uh, so what happens, you can see how dry it is now, and oh, a perfect hole as well from the borer beetle. Isn't that cool? But so what happens is it dries out, the borers get in, and then another one of a tree's nemesis can also get in much easier, especially while the wood's dry, and you can actually see on this side over here where the termites are already in. And uh, even though it doesn't look too bad from the outside, on the inside it can be it's a bit more solid this side, but completely eaten. And 
as we move around, you can actually see a tiny bit of bark and cambium layer that is still active here because it's actually dry and rotten on the other side, but it's still taking nutrients from the ground up towards the top of the tree. So what happens in these situations is as the bore, at every season and especially in the dry season, as the tree dries out more and more and more, the more borers get in, the more termites get in, and often the end of these trees is that they'll still be alive with these little bits taking stuff up and they just basically get so rotten that they can't hold the weight of the rest of the tree and just collapse. Oh, let's go across to Steve with Shadulu having her breakfast. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Brent. Um, nice to be talking about the knob thorn and the damage done. Uh, talking about trees, we've got uh, the marula tree that this young female is in. And the knob thorn and the marula are the two major trees that scientists are, are noticing that are disappearing due to elephant activity because of their ever-ending, ever never-ending search for the most tender bark and cambium that these trees provide. <clears throat> and what we've seen out here is how important these trees are for the survival of so many species. I mean, not just the leopards. We get such piss, picturesque sort of views of the leopards up the trees feeding on things. But aren't they just absolutely essential for the survival? I mean, how many other animals have we noticed are paying attention or, or moving around in relation to, to the marulas? We have the elephants completely at the, the will of the dropping fruits. We see them moving around, moving around from marula to marula. And without them, what will happen one day? So that is something scientists are paying attention to, the demise of marulas and knobthorns, two very, very important trees for this environment. And Maureen wants to know if the cheetah and the leopard, the tail, have a similar purpose. Well. Definitely for balance. The cheetah doesn't do too much climbing. The cheetah's tail works very, very well as a sort of rudder in the turning of the, the movement when the cheetah's moving at completely an, an enormous amount of speed. That tail enables it to turn very sharply. And I'm sure that the leopard has that sort of ability as well. But what it's using its tail for is kind of a counterweight to balance it in the tree. So that is what when you look at most animals that are tree dwelling their tail works very, very well as a sort of counterbalance. Whereas the cheetah is not much of an arboreal sort of species, that tail works in the speed and pursuit of, of prey. And just that slight little movement of left to right enables the cheetah to counterbalance its movement at, at enormous speed. Um, I've never seen a leopard at the kind of speeds that cheetahs move at, so it's hard for me to say if they use it as well in that sort of counterbalance when it comes to running, but definitely in the tree you can see how the tail assists in that sort of um, that balancing sort of act. She is absolutely loving her Dacre. Okay, let's quickly go over to Taylor who's got one of those small and beautiful insects. We do. It's like we're doing bushwalk from the car this morning. We have found ourselves a sleeping dragonfly. So be careful not to talk too loudly. I'm just joking. I don't think it's too bothered by us. Now, it's on a guari tree, and if you're wondering why is it not moving, it's because it's very cold this morning, and it's obviously slightly frozen. It hasn't quite warmed up its wings and its legs just yet, but it's in the perfect position because it is sitting on the eastern side of this quarry tree. So, like we said, as soon as the sun pokes through the clouds, it'll warm up and it'll be able to carry on with its day. It looks like a banded groundling, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, very, very pretty dragonfly. They come in all sorts of different colors. I don't know if, how often I see these playing black ones, though. It was quite cool how we spotted it as we drove past. It did hit the brakes quite hard because I thought, no, that's not a dragonfly sitting so close to the car. How preposterous. But here it sits. They're beautiful, though. Look at those wings. It would be nice if we actually had uh, a little bit of golden light on this dragonfly. I'm also hearing a guinea fowl that's shouting now. But good, not good news, good news for the guinea fowl. Tingana has been found. Tingana is 
off in the a little bit further west of us in fact he went patrolling we found his tracks going across the dam wall but sadly out of our traverse so we won't be able to see him unless he gets on the move and comes back this way which wouldn't surprise me dragonfly thank you very much i hope you warm up soon it's quite small as well not very particularly big We've been lucky. We've been seeing so many dragonflies. It was Manu's favorite thing to film. We try and catch the dragonflies on camera in the Mara. It was quite nice. Off we go. Let's look down here. Now boardwalk. As we drive through the Sabi Sand, you're wondering what reserves do we drive on? Well, we are driving in quite a big reserve at the moment. We're in, in South Africa, we drive in the, the Sabi Sand Viltain, which is one of the most, well, it is the most famous safari destination in South Africa. What do I mean, the, one of the most? And it's uh, known for its leopards as well, Steve has proven this morning. So it's about 60,000 hectares, what's that, about 130,000 acres of pristine wilderness, uh, unfenced and open to the Kruger National Park, so the animals can all move around here, which is quite nice. Essentially, they've got a, just over 8 million acres of land to go around on, and then we specifically drive on Juma, private game reserve and Chitwa Chitwa. So those are two reserves within the Sabi Sand Viltain. So privately la uh, owned land. And then also up in the Mara, we take, we will be just not having a little rest, we're sorting out a couple of things there, but we'll be up in the Mara soon again. So that's in Kenya, so the Mara Triangle and the Maasai Mara Reserve. So that's very exciting. If this is your first time watching us, keep watching, because I promise you, you'll love it. And, and wait till you see the wide open plains. The two locations are very, very different. There's obviously got a lot more trees to it, a lot more sort of woody plant species. Now, Edward, going back to the dragonfly, you've asked what are those black patches on the wings of that dragonfly? Well, not all dragonflies have those patches, so I assume it's just a unique marking to the banded ground links. That's how I, well, it's how I actually identified it, it's because it's got those little bands on it. I don't think there's any specific purpose for them. Perhaps it helps aid in camouflage, uh, but... Um, I mean, it didn't, wasn't very well camouflaged in that tree, to be honest. I spotted it quite easily. Uh, so, yeah, so no, I don't think there's any use. Like I said, there's other dragonfly species out there that just lack them completely. In fact, most of them have fairly clean wings. There's not normally many, many markings on them. But maybe I'm wrong also. I maybe just haven't read that part in the book yet. I'm still getting there. So I will go and have a little look at dragonflies and see what I can find out about it. Okay, we're going to keep searching and hopefully we're going to find some other leopard tracks, seeing as though Tangana's given us the slip and uh, moved off to an area we can't drive in. But Shidulu has not given Steve the slip just yet. Yes, she has managed to pull the Daker back up and she's now enjoying the very nice meat around the Daker's neck and face. Now you can see the head of the Daker as the rest of the body hangs on by a thread. I'm sure we're only moments away from most of it collapsing to the ground, but there are no hyena anywhere to be seen. I wonder how many of them came and visited this area last night. I have no doubt they would have come and seen if they could have grabbed a morsel or a bone or something that might have fallen, but it doesn't seem as if anything has fallen. She's made a marvellous job of completely devouring most of that daker while keeping it intact. Wisteria would like to know if the cats sleep in the tree to make sure the kill doesn't get stolen, and that does often happen. Um, we found her just on the floor, where, where you, if you were watching when we started, that's where she was. But she spent the whole of yesterday afternoon in the tree on a branch opposite from where the kill is. And it's not uncommon for leopards to sleep very close to their kill. But if a male leopard, for example, ooh, she is enjoying the face now. That is the eye she's about to lick off. Oh, let's have a listen, shall we? Let's see if we can hear the crunching of the face.
Isn't that marvelous? Nothing goes to waste here, folks. She'll eat as much of that dacre as she possibly can. And then the bones that do eventually fall on the floor will probably fall prey or victim to the marauding hyenas that are for their never-ending quest for bone marrow and nutrients. So yes, for Stere, they will they will sleep in the tree. And if a male leopard happened to come along, it would probably go straight up the tree and steal that kill from her. She'd have no chance protecting it from a, another male leopard. A female leopard she might be able to ward off, but a male leopard should have have no chance at all. So if Us uh, not Osana, but possibly if Hukumuri decided to come into the scene, and there's not too much to to be taken now, but if he came in while the kill was in the tree, no doubt he would have stolen it. Even Hasana seems to have done that. He's done that with Tundi before. Oh, she caught it. <laughs> a marvelous catch. What a marvelous catch for a cat. Look at that. So it is getting to the end of the feeding potential of this Daker. Uh, it is soon going to be falling on the floor. <laughs> Michelle, yes, the crunch is quite something. We were trying to listen last night, but the wind was just too strong. We could hear it from the vehicle. But we just weren't able to pick it up on the ambient for you. But last night she was really enjoying sort of the rib and leg areas of, of the Daker. <laughs> Laura Moore comments that it's like cracking a crab. Indeed, a bit of lobster, lobster claw for dinner. Ah, oh, there's some hyenas calling off to our left-hand side. They are rather far off, though. She's not bothered, though. She knows she's safe up there. Many, many years of evolution have made the leopard the king of the tree. And they know once they're in the tree, they really are completely safe from any other predators, barring a possible other leopard coming in. But let's... We're going to stay with this female. Let's go back over to Brent on foot and let's see what he has. Let's see what updates he has for you. So we've made our way towards Chele Pan, and again I was hoping for flowers, but it is devoid of flowers here. So I'm going to go down to the waterhole, and you always got to be quite careful when you approach waterholes. Now, I've been gone for so long that I'm not used to not seeing buffalo everywhere. So I'm even extra cautious when I come up to these because when I left there was buffalo bulls everywhere, but not too many of them at the moment. So still pays to be cautious so you do not end up riding on top of a buffalo, well, on top of a buffalo's horns. So here we are at the waterhole. Good morning, Patrick. Patrick's wondering, what do I like the most about bushwalk? Well, Patrick, I just like being out in foot, and you don't have the sound of the car. You've got all the bird sounds. The, uh, there's hyena that Steve was talking about. We're actually quite close to us, probably uh, about a kilometer uh, to the west. I could hear them calling, ooh. Uh, so it's being able to hear everything and the sights, the smells without da -da 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 from a car. Although Dave does walk like a breeding herd of elephants behind you. Doof, doof, doof. No, I'm only joking, Darby. Um, that's Chandra. Um But yeah, so no, it's, I, I just like being out on foot. Uh, of course, I, I really love tracking big cats on foot. But unfortunately, we don't have any cats to track. So I said I wasn't going to go look for a leopard. I lied. Well, I changed my mind. I didn't lie. So we were going to go up towards Gallagher. We decided to come back down. And we're going to walk all the way to the southern boundary and check around Twin Dams because Hosanna does do strange things, loop around, so he could have very easily crossed back into Juma. So we're going to go see see if he's come through. Maureen is saying, watch out for crocodiles. I think I'm okay here, Maureen. Um, it is it is quite a shallow pan. I've actually walked through it before. Um, but I will be very careful of crocodiles, Maureen. I've, I've spent quite a lot of time with crocodiles, over the years. Ooh, tracking quiz. What do you think, Dave? Let's do a tracking quiz. All of those four tracks in my circle there are of the same animal. 
So let's see if anyone knows what animal has been visiting the waterhole. Uh, hashtag Safari Live if you know. What animal... Ooh, Nicola Austin has already got it right, but I'm not going to say what it is just yet. Well done, Nikki. Now, what you're looking at here is the quite rounded front and the quite rounded back. It's a sort of a giveaway. Also, the size. Um, if I, you can see the size next to my finger. Not too big, but also not too small. Ooh. Josh and BK say Impala. Unfortunately not. I'll see if I can find an Impala track around here. So Impala are far more sharp in the front. So they've got a, a real sort of sharp point, like a lot of the antelopes. There we go. And it, can see a very sharp points of the impala there little a little bit longer than those tracks but not as wide well done daniel in scotland you are spot on it is a piggy it is a warthog oh where are you there's a chagra in that tangle ah it's not a chagra i lied it is the great mimic of the african bush you see it f oh, there we go And it is James Henry's favorite bird. They have an absolutely stunning call. So who knows what James Henry's favorite bird is? Hashtag Safari Live, if you know the answer. Very predominant callers at dusk and dawn. Beautiful. And they do mimic a lot of other birds as well. Okay, so we're going to keep slowly moving down these animal paths on the edge of the Moati River, heading towards Twin Dams. While we do that, let's go back across to Madam McCurdy. Right. Brent, I hope all those creepy crawlies come out. You won't believe it. We found some lion tracks. Well, I suppose it's not that hard to believe. And um, we're just trying to figure out where they're going now. So I'm, I'm on them. They're still going this way. That's good news. I just don't know what our signal is like over here. So Nikki, please tell me if I need to stop. Uh, and we are fast approaching a cut line too. So let's let's hope that they uh, don't cross out because it'd be quite nice to see some lions and. Apparently the Styx Pride have been around, so I would suspect that it's their tracks. It's not just male lion tracks, although there have been many male lion tracks, which are probably the Birminghams, some of them at least. Now, we had our rain roofs on yesterday because it was all very gloomy and it, well, showed signs of raining. And so if you're wondering that, did it eventually rain? The answer to that question is no, it did not rain at all not even a little bit in fact like not even a spit of rain so we put those roofs on for nothing but rather be prepared uh, than getting caught out in a storm that's never too good now if you're wondering why am i not looking back at the camera it's because the grass is so long here and the lion must just be sitting and i'll drive straight past it today so i'm just keeping a close eye because i don't have the tracks on the road anymore so at some point while i've been talking to you they turned off What's that? I don't think it's anything. I think it's just a Logosaurus. I'm very good at spotting Logosauruses. We'll go back. Nope. It's a herd of Impala very far away. So we're going to get up to the the cut line and have a little look there and check it to see if any lines have crossed out. Because again, I, I don't want to be tracking animals that are not around anymore because it's such a waste of time. I'd rather try and find some that are still around. So that's going to be our goal this morning now. We've changed from leopards and we're on to lions. Right. Steve, however, of course, is the man of the match today. He's uh, relocated on Shidulu. She's having her breakfast. Let's go and see if she's uh, finished off those eyeballs. 
Yes, thanks, Taylor. Lion tracks, that would be marvellous. It's probably the Sticks Pride. If you're on Chitra, I think Brent was talking about the fact that they were there sort of in the east yesterday morning. So it's most likely the Sticks. We haven't seen them in the ages. And yes, the Shadula female is up the tree. Absolutely beautiful backdrop. I wonder if these cats realize what beautiful surroundings they find themselves in. And you can just see her. Isn't that a beautiful backdrop, folks? This is our morning. Beautiful Sunday morning it is as the sun starts to come up through the clouds in the east. Just starting to warm the temperatures just a little bit. Starting to backlight the beautiful leopard as Senzo slowly moves in to show you where she sits in this majestic and gloriously painted marula with the backdrop of that sky. Isn't that fantastic and there she is you can see her daker leg hanging from below her belly with her rudder like tail balancing her nicely as she actually lies down this time feeding on the remains the last final snippets of the daker's neck I'm sure it will be dropping to the ground soon and she slowly finds the last bits and pieces of its meat to be eaten. J-World wants to know if Dakers and Dick Dicks are the same size. Now I'm going to have to look in my book, J-World, because I've never seen a Dick Dick in my life. So I'm going to have a look at the size for you and then let you know. But Dacre is the third smallest sort of antelope we find in this area. So, um, yeah, there we go. Nikki is saying dick dicks are very small, and but you get a number of species. I know there's an entire book out there, a huge book, just on dick dicks, but we don't get them here in South Africa, so I really don't know enough about them. But let me have a little look. Okay, so the Damara dick dick, which you find in in Namibia, has a weight of five kilograms. When the Steenbok is 11 kilograms, and Steenbok is almost the same size as a Dacre, so yeah, a Dick Dick is very, very, very small. Sharp's close book, 7.5. That is the smallest antelope that we get here. The smallest in total is the Blue Dacre, which is about 4 kilograms, and then the Common Dacre, which is what is up the tree there, can get up to as much as 21 kilograms, which is a fair amount of meat. You double that to get the pounds. It's about 40-odd pounds. Easy enough for a leopard to take up. It's about equivalently half her weight or half a male's weight, but easy enough seeing as they can hoist prey animals that are twice, almost twice their body weight up a tree. Incredible that you're able to do that. Pound for pound, the strongest cat in the business, leopards. If you made a leopard the size of a lion, I reckon it would be an absolute beast. <laughs> Hello Maureen. Again, you want to know what body language leopards give when they want to be alone. Well, first of all, if a leopard does not want to be seen, it will just disappear. You won't even see the body language. Um, the behavior that you might see if, for example, you are disturbing it is it will might go flat in the grass, ears down on its head, and you might see a flick of the tail. That is a warning sign that is basically saying do not come any closer. Um, but generally, before that stage, the leopard slinks off if it doesn't want to be seen. They are masters of stealth and camouflage. And if leopard does not want to be seen, they just move off. The leopards of the Sabi Sands are absolute superstars. And they love performing in front of the camera. I haven't experienced any behavior like that from a Sabi Sands leopard because they are quite relaxed to the vehicle. They know that we are just taking photos and video as this Shadulu female really enjoys the face of this Dacre. Mm. What have you spotted, young lady? Constantly alert, folks. Constantly alert. Even though she's got some food and got a relatively full belly, they are always prepared and alert for anything that might sneak up. Any small antelope or impala or something that might make itself available, they will constantly be prepared to to catch and and hoist
but we're thinking we're going to move out of this the sighting shortly and we had some tracks of a breeding herd of buffalo that crossed the road on our way in but we wanted to come and see what or if she was in in this place still from last night and what we do know with the buffalo coming in is we might get tracks or activity of lions following them in who knows maybe Hassan has decided to follow them as well but we had a breeding herd coming in from the north we might go and follow up and see if we can find those buffalo that would be a good addition to the morning. Dino Man has made a very good comment statement there about like how do leopard males know whether a cub is theirs or not? For example, Hukumuri knows that a cub is not his because he hasn't been here so how does Tingana know if the cub is his or not well it's a very good question that and the fact that leopards and lions both have what we call induced ovulation that is the thing that is the reality behind it is that copulation is not guaranteed to provide offspring so there's always that sort of unknown for a male if he's sort of serviced that female and mates with her and she has a cub he might think it's hers so it actually adds to the survival potential of that cub but if a male meets a female he's never encountered before he knows for a fact it's not his so it's very hard to actually know how they do know or don't know whether it's theirs or not and that is the sort of the the crux of the matter and the reason why ovulation and reproduction in leopards and lions is so slow or so poor to enable the males to sort of have like a guessing game is it mine is it not so it's very hard to really know better do they know can they smell it so it's it's difficult to really know how they do know or don't know but if they've mates with a female there's kind of that 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 understanding that he potentially might be the father as the sun clears the clouds in the background illuminating a beautiful marula tree and a beautiful leopardess So we're going to move, be moving out shortly to go follow up on some buffalo as the hyena calls in the distance. I wonder if they've spotted Brent on Bushwalk. Let's go over to Brent and see what they are up to. Well, the hyena's over there, but we've just heard some elephants not too far up ahead of us. Sounds like just on the other side of this little river. So we've started moving a little bit quicker, but still very cautiously. And uh, it's going to be very nice to be with elephants on foot. So I'm very excited. And remember, this is 100% live. And you can send us questions on the hashtag Safari Live. Or just pop it on whatever feed you might be watching on. So we are busy walking up towards... Elephants. So the Ellie's sound like they were just beyond these thickets in front of us here. Around there. So we're going to be very careful as we go forward from here. So we're going to sneak. A proud cat mama is wondering, do I carry an ash bag on bushwalk? Now, I know a lot of the other presenters do, but I don't. I don't feel the need. I can normally work out the wind quite easily. And there's lots of different ways. You can just do that. Or what I normally do is while I'm walking, I'll hit my stick against the ground and just see which way the wind is blowing. Swapner is wondering, do we get heart beast in the Sabi Sands area? Uh, no, we don't. Well, we get... There were a few sesame, possibly historically, um, but very, very few of them. And they're part of the heart beast family, but we've got no true heart beasts here. But you can just hear branches breaking in the distance. Um, the red heart beast is the only heart beast that occurs naturally in, in southern Africa in numbers. Um, people say they were Lichtenstein's heart beast, but knowing there where I've seen them and where they are, I think it's very, very unlikely. So, 
no no natural occurring hartebeest in the Sabi Sands. And the red hartebeest prefers arid areas, so towards the north uh, of the country, towards the Kalahari Desert. I'm just trying to listen again to get an exact bearing on where the eddies are. Uh, Christine is wondering, have I seen Gnormus Gnormen the Gnu uh, since I've been back? Uh, no, I haven't, Christine. Unfortunately, Gnormus Gnormen the Gnu lives on Cheetah Plains, and we don't traverse there at the moment. And Herbie's doing my listening for me up ahead. So it was a... Which is normally a female elephant instilling discipline in some young, up, uppity youngster. But if we're really lucky, they might be heading towards Twin Dams and we can find a spot where we can watch them go drink. And I was just saying, I've lost Hassan's tracks. Hassan, but we knew he went out this way. Um, but we're hoping that he's looped back towards Shabam and Treehouse Dam, so we're just going to go check there. And speaking of someone who's tracking while I try to get a view of these elephants, let's go back to Taylor McCurdy. Well, getting is what we're trying to achieve at the moment. Um, so, just an update, the Lions have been playing lots of games with us, it's been quite fun. They came from the east and were going west. Then their tracks zigzagged and went south, and I was like, okay. Okay, so we followed them. Then they go west again, and then they went south, and now we're back on them. And if you look in the road, you can actually see lots and lots and lots of footprints. Those are all line tracks. This is an entire pride that has been walking over here. The only problem is that we are on the boundary now, and they are going west at the moment, so we're going to see how long that they sort of stay on this road. But yeah, but they've definitely been walk walking here. You can't see the nice ones, but the nice tracks, the really, really fresh ones are the ones here. A couple of them in the middle look like older ones, but they're also fresh ones. Males, females, it looks like there were some Birmingham boys, big male lines that were walking here too. So we're going to just carry on. But I have a sad suspicion that I think these cats have probably crossed off of the property. And the reason why I think they were zigzagging like that is perhaps they were stopping, listening, trying to hear if there's, well, any food around, so if there's a herd of buffalo or some impala or water buck, all chatting away at night. The lions, of course, are going to be responding, so that will encourage them to change the direction quite often. They weren't running, they were just walking. Bye-bye, lions. Off they go down there, guys. That's it. We can't follow them anymore, unfortunately. Ah, ah. That's a paid tea. That's a serious pity. But anyways, we're not having much luck. Leopards are crossing off of our traverse. Now the lion's also crossing out of a traverse. And I don't think they're too far away either. Uh, let's have a little scan on here. Now, all now, I'm wondering if... I haven't seen any sable up here, sable up here in the northern Sabi Sands. The only times I've seen sable have most of the time have been down in the su uh, southern sections of Kruger, so like around, um, there's actually Impala, which we can have a look at. I'll show you Impala. These are not sable. Where was I? I'm trying to remember now. What gate? Numbi gate? Fabeni gate? Down there, those areas. And it's quite nice. I was hoping that the Impala were in fact looking at something, but it doesn't seem that way. I'm, I'm sure they further up north as well. I, I just haven't seen many sable. I'm trying to remember my first sable where I saw it. I was very young, though, in Kruger. Very, very young. And I'll never forget, it was standing next to the car. We didn't even know it was there, but it, had, it basically had frozen. Craig, do you know what else I've seen? There's a whole ton of vultures. Look over there. <laughs> Nikki is saying, Nikki's directing today, she said the only sable she's ever seen is a picture on the dam cam. <laughs> quite funny. So there's vultures. There's quite a few of them, in fact, all roosting up in these trees. So I wonder if that's not where the lions are. Although I thought they were here yesterday. So maybe they were just also roosting there. We did see lots of vultures settling in for the night last night with the terrible weather. 
So that could also just be the case. But there are lots, lots and lots and lots of vultures. You can't see them all, but all down in that valley. And it is the same direction that those lion tracks go. Of course, vultures are diurnal. They're not moving around at night, so they wouldn't have been following the lions at night time. So unless they've made a kill maybe yesterday at some point. I don't know. The mystery. Many, many mysteries. Ha. But we will try. We'll keep scratching around here. Otherwise, we're going to head back uh, onto Juma. And then maybe go check around Cheetah Cutline, Drakensberg, and see if Tundi is perhaps around. Maybe she's come back. But Steve was thinking about leaving Shudulu. Something has changed his mind. Let's go have another look at her. Yeah, thanks very much, Taylor. I hope you managed to find those lions. Um, I was about to, to leave and send us like, but what happens if she comes down? Once she finishes eating that face, she's probably going to come down and move and maybe go and drink. So we reckon we might stay with her for a little while longer and see if that does actually happen. And it'd be marvelous to follow her and get some nice images of her in the long grass moving as well as possibly drinking. And we'd probably go all the way as far as Galago Pan, which is um, not too far from here, I don't think. I can show you on the map in a moment or two how far away it is exactly. But she is making short work of that Daker's neck and face. <laughs> Ali, I'll get back to your question now. We are just on Aubrey's Road over here. And the Gallagher Pan is just in this sort of section over here. So it's not very far from where we are. I don't think. Am I right, Sens? It's about there. Okay, so if she drinks, she's probably going to go over there to drink. That is my assumption. And uh, where we, if I show you on the map here, this is where we had tracks of those buffalo coming in from sort of Gallego side, probably from the north, coming in towards this area. So they're probably headed down towards Treehouse Dam. So when we do leave eventually, we'll probably see if we can follow up in that area. But Ali wants to know, would a leopard hoist a live animal in a tree? Um, normally, Ali, they kill the prey first, purely because that the, the alarm call that an animal gives off when it is being murdered is enough to attract all sorts of other attention. So they will often suffocate, either on the nose or on the neck, to try and to prevent that noise from happening. They've done lots of studies to, to figure out why do animals make this dying, bleating call. And what they've realized is that that call attracts absolutely everything. So from hyena to lion to leopard to even cheetah will move into an area where they hear that alarm call. Not that alarm call, that distress call. Because what they realized over many, many years is that the distress call didn't sort of frighten. So the impala gets pulled down by a leopard. The distress call actually attracts some of the impala to come and have a look what's going on. Um, it doesn't force the leopard to let it go because it's not like a when you grab a frog or cricket sometimes they make this explosive scary sound which forces you to like, whoa, what was that? It doesn't do that. But what it does do is it attracts attention from other predators and they quickly come in and that noise or that momentary lapse of concentration from, from the predator can sometimes allow that animal to run away. I've seen it many, many times where uh, a, a lion or a leopard pulls something down and as they pull it down that, Meh. sorry about that man, she didn't get it, she didn't move towards that. But as they make that noise, something else comes in, the predator sort of moves away from a moment and off it goes. So that is the purpose of that distress call, is to hopefully attract the attention of someone else who will sort of take the attention away of the killer in the moment. Let's go back to our face-eating leopard. We can hear her crunching away at the jawbone right now. <laughs> Lone. Wow, there's an interesting topic flowing this morning. Lorne wants to know if uh, leopards have been known to keep live prey hostage and eat it later. Lorne, I've never noticed leopards doing that. What I have seen with lion, leopard, and cheetah, not directly myself, but I have seen documentaries of it as well, is they quite often will catch something and not kill it. Generally a youngster, a baby animal, they'll catch it and then present it to their their cubs and then allow the cubs to play with catch and eventually kill that animal so the leopards don't do it for themselves to keep as a larder for later live anyway they do it to allow their youngsters to practice the killing stroke and the catching so 
it is definitely something that needs to be learnt from the cat. They can catch. They're very good at catching. But the dispatching and the, the throat strangling is something that they need to practice. So quite often uh, adults will, will provide their youngsters with an easy meal. What are you looking at, young lady? She has got an, a marvelous vantage point from up there. It's impossible for us to see what she's looking at. But isn't she beautiful? She's very focused on something, but nothing there. Back to her meal. She does have a very unusual spot pattern. Nikki's commenting in my ear. And James Richard commented last night that, that it's something that's within the family. On her right-hand side, she's got that row of four spots with a dot above, which appears to be quite sort of genetic with her, her family tree which is quite an interesting thing to pay attention to. When you spend enough time with the leopards out here, it's awesome to see how they differ from each other. Yeah, she's really enjoying the face and the head right now. Nothing goes to waste, folks. Look at the carnassial shear. Cutting through the sinew of the head. And it really appears as if this was a very old male Dacre. When you look at those horns, if you go into those horn sends, you can see how the one is much shorter and stubbier than the other, which indicates probably a, a long territorial period of, of rubbing and scratching. I don't know what other reason there would be for one horn being a lot blunter than the other one. And how this Dacre died, we still are very unsure very unsure the vehicle is about to join us in the sighting if you do hear that i do apologize but we're going to stay here i think a little bit longer because i think she's nearly finished eating this head and then from there on who knows what she's going to do but let's go over to brent for an update on foot well we're still stalking towards those elephants they're somewhere up here but we found a wild flower that is not a waltharia and not a justicia. Here we go, isn't that pretty? It is a wild foxglove. Now you can eat the leaves and roots of the foxglove. I can add it into a, a vegetable stew or just a group of vegetables. I personally don't like it very much. It's got a very strong smell. What do you say that smells like, Dave? Mm, yeah, it doesn't smell tasty. Uh, maybe when it cooks it becomes a bit more tasty, but I don't think I would want to eat the wild foxglove. As I said, very few flowers around this year. I'm trying to describe the smell. What would you say? Cat urine? Somewhere close, so not quite, but sort of like cat urine. Yeah, so not a very pleasant smell at all. So as I said, the elephants are still quite close here somewhere. So what we've done is we've actually looped round and we're going to approach them here. There's quite a few big marulas that are fruiting in this area and I think that's where they're going to be. Nice little sort of band of marulas through the center of this area. So Lynn, James, Judy and many others got the name of that bird correct. James Henry's favorite bird. It was indeed the white-browed scrub robin. Now, when you look at elephant dung at the moment, as I said, this is a bit older, but look, there's just so many marulas in it. Marula, 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 marula. I can't care enough saying marula. So it's, it's probably likely that that's what these ellies are doing. Um, they found one of the sort of later fruiting trees, and they're taking advantage of it now before the winter sets in. Okay. Well, watch the stick, Davy. Cedar is asking, do we mask our scent for bush walking? Well, us as guides, we smell quite nice, but we generally try to spray the cameraman or rub the elephant dung on them because they're quite smelly creatures. No, I'm only joking, of course. No, we don't mask our scent. Uh, one must remember that human beings have been part of this ecosystem for hundreds of thousands of years. 
and animals do have extinct instinctive responses to you and uh, if you walk carefully and considerately same as in a vehicle you can enjoy sightings without upsetting the animals now one of the more interesting things is when you find something like an impala or wildebeest and you walk just like we're walking now and you like de da like de da and you walk straight past them they'll watch you maybe snort at you but they normally won't run away but as soon as you start changing your behavior and you start acting like a predator that is when they'll start running away so uh, human beings have been watch out dev there we go well done uh, human beings have been a around in the bush for many hundreds of thousands of years so the animals do know how to behave around us and so do we a lot of people think like if they're on a bushwalk and they get charged by a lion they're definitely going to run but your instinct actually takes over and a lot of people just that you just freeze because that's what you got to do as soon as you run um, so the most important thing is never run because as soon as you run you get into big trouble and uh, as in most of the predators and even elephants and, and buffalo that movement will trigger a chase instinct in them and they'll come after you now Edward's wondering how cautious do you have to be to go up to Ellie's on foot now it all depends on the Ellie's Edward. so a big elephant bull you don't need to be that cautious um, they, you can get quite close to them and you can we almost let them know you're there and they're actually sometimes more comfortable with that and they'll watch you and sometimes even come closer to you elephant breeding herds you do have to be more cautious uh, they tend to be a bit more temperamental so those elephants managed to cross Gowrie Main behind us I heard footsteps so I think we might have been a bit late I'm trying to loop around in front of them of course elephants can walk much faster than we can <laughs> cover a lot of ground but hopefully you'll find some more a little bit later but yes yeah, so with breeding herds you have to be more cautious um, you generally don't like to let them see you and uh, you'll try to sort of sneak about and keep the wind in your favor but with elephant bulls it's normally okay so let's hope we find a big elephant bull maybe even Daryl I saw Daryl yesterday um, and he does move around quite a bit so we're checking here now hoping Hassan has done a loop and come back in to Juma but while we keep checking carefully and hopefully find some more elephants uh, let's go back across to Taylor McCurdy the hurdy birdie we did have a fish eagle but did I say fish eagle or did I make up a word there Craig? fish, fish eagle did I say fish eagle? I don't know what I just said there. Anyways, we did have one, but then it did what birds do best and flew away. Typical. <laughs> Typical. Right, so I think we're going to give up on chit for this morning. Can't be lucky all the time now, but we did. We tried our best. Craig only gave about 30% though. No, <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> oh, here's a great question. Now, Nicole. I'm just quickly checking the road, make sure first there's no cars and also for tracks. If you're wondering what animal have I not seen and will, would like to see, there's many, many an animal that I have not seen yet. I would like to see a pangolin, please. Pretty please, can I see a pangolin? I would like to see a striped hyena, that would be quite cool too. Um, there's lots of birds that I haven't seen yet that I want to see like the African pitta, that's one of them. Um, trying to think what other mammal species, there's so many. And of course I can't think of that. I think the one I really want to see the most is probably a pangolin. I don't even think I've seen a pangolin track in the sand before. So that would be quite nice. Craig? Yeah. Pangolin as well? You've never seen one? No, they don't exist. I think it's like a mythical creature that you know a few people have all just jumped on the bandwagon and, and said. Uh, and <laughs> Nikki's now telling me all the animals that she wants to see. Nikki wants to have a good look at a honey badger. I've been fortunate enough. I miss seeing honey badgers actually, and I don't know why we don't see them here. 
Well, we do, and I know the grass is quite long at the moment, so that definitely will explain, you know, it to some extent. But when I was down in the southern Sabi sand, my goodness, most evenings, just after the sun had set, that sort of half an hour after, just as the last of the light starting to fade, the really tricky light, uh, you, you'd see them digging in rhino middens. Digging away, digging away, getting all the little beetle larvae and all sorts of other little insects and things that may be in there. And they were normally quite relaxed as well. We had some really great sightings. Sometimes a little bit too far away to take a picture, but you could sort of, well, a decent one, because, you know, if it's too dark like that, you've got to change all your camera settings. So I also don't have a really good picture of a honey badger. But you'd be able to sit from a little bit of a distance, and they'd quite happily go about the, the evening, which was quite nice. I've had here at my first bushwalk that I ever did at Wild Earth. We had uh, two honey badgers on foot, which was quite cool. But it, I don't know if we actually put them on camera, but we had them run past us, so that was fun. They are. Ooh. Now, here's something I have seen, Anna Marie. You're wondering if I've ever seen an aardvolf? Yes. Many, 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 many. I've spoiled in seeing brown hyena, caracal, serval, aardvolf, African wildcat. Not African wildcat, not so much in the Eastern Cape, but the other animals that I was just mentioning. I was very lucky to spend quite a bit of uh, time with them. Uh, so, yeah, the Eastern Cape is great for lots of the small things. I've got male left tracks again. Crikey, where are they going? Yeah, so maybe towards Cheetah Cut Lines. So that's good news. We'll have a little scratch here then and see who's around. Uh, so, so, yeah, so I've seen, I haven't seen one. Oh, no, I lied. I saw one in the Mara. Just one, though. David and I saw it together, which was quite cool. And I think that was David's first one, in fact. And it was such a nice sighting. It came, it came running out of the grass onto the road, and I quickly switched the car off and then stopped in the road, turned around, looked at us and then just sort of slowly walked off into the grass. And that was quite nice. Very special to see things like that. But I, other than that, prior, I couldn't tell you when the last time I'd seen an aardvolf was before my sighting in the Mara. Mm. Ooh. Now, Mel, Nanny, you're wondering if there are any wolves on the safari, or have I ever seen one? No, no, no wolves, unfortunately, uh, where we are. I'm trying to think the closest thing to a wolf out here is probably going to be an African wild dog, or perhaps the jackals, which are descendants of uh, canines. So, um, so, yeah, well, they, well, I suppose descendants of wolves, sorry, was what I was supposed to say. Descendants of wolves, they're in the, uh, well, wild dogs are in the, the wonderful dog family so yeah no sadly no wolves i used to the closest i've ever come to a wolf is we had a timber wolf cross alaskan malamute i can't tell you a sad story very quickly as we have a dnc there are some young male leopard tracks bobbing on and off this road so i'm just going to keep an eye out as we drive and um, basically what happened was in nisna which is a coastal town on the garden route so it's sort of between port elizabeth and cape town and there's a wolf, there used to be a wolf sanctuary there. I, I don't know how it started. I can't give you too much information on that. However, anyways, somebody went and poisoned all these dogs because they didn't agree that they were in South Africa and in our climate and fair enough. I didn't really know the story. I was little, I was quite young. And two puppies survived. Uh, they weren't pure wolves though. These were Alaskan Malamutes cross timber wolves. So uh, we, basically knew the guy that got given the puppies he was a vet and phoned my mom and said you have a big property you know these dogs need to go somewhere where they can be able to run around we lived on a small holding so of course my mom can't say no to animals so we got this dog and it was he was massive he must have weighed about 80 kilograms at the end he was he was huge but yeah so we had that's the closest i've come to a wolf his name was branson he was beautiful he was a lovely dog uh, but yeah, so that's that's the closest I've ever come to a wolf. Different though, like it was quite interesting to see. He was not a normal dog. He was, he was very wild. There was just something different about him. Uh, it was a little bit eerie, in fact. You'd look at him, I don't know. Loved my little brother, loved Sean a lot. Followed him around like a bad smell. Just would not leave his side at all. Very protective over him too. Uh, so yeah, so, so that was Branson. But, no, we won't be seeing any wolves out here, sadly. Perhaps when uh, Brent doesn't shave, they might do, he look like a werewolf. So we might have something to look forward to in a few weeks. <laughs>
uh, just jokes. Not really. Right. Off we go. Back to Steve. Uh, hopefully I'll be joining him with a leopard this morning. But, well, seeing as I don't have one, go and enjoy some rosettes. Thanks, Taylor. Sorry about your sad story about a dog. What animal that does really enjoy eating dogs is leopards, in fact. And in and around the sort of high felt Johannesburg, Pretoria area, we do have many, many leopards still living there. And they do make their living off of domestic animals, such as Jack Russells and small dogs, as sad as that might sound. A very adaptable cat is able to live in those environments quite close to humans and still survive, which to me is a marvelous feat. As the Shadulu continues to crunch at the bones and see if you can hear it. Quite interesting how she puts her tongue to the opposite side of her mouth as she's using the carnassial shear. On the other side, the tongue is actually completely on the opposite side of the mouth. Well, only moments ago, she was munching along and the head fell off and she looked down very forlornly at the head as it careened down to the floor. The hyenas that were calling in the distance have yet to make any appearance. I reckon they know there's not much left over from a Deka. But I find it quite interesting. Can you go into her ear there, Sims, please? She's got an enormous amount of ticks on the side of her head and the back of her neck. Huge amount of ticks feasting on her. They don't seem to be causing too much, too much harm to her. But there's some really, really large gorged females on the back of her neck who will shortly be falling off into the grass to provide Steph and the rest of the bushwalk people marvelous itchy legs in the weeks to come. Mia, you'd like to know if a lion would be able to take that kill from her. If Senzo can just pan out a bit and give you an idea of how high up in the tree she is. Have a look here. And panning right out, see how high up in the tree she is. It's going to go down to, we're not even at ground level there, so she's quite high. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think a lion would be able to get all the way up there. It's possible it would be able to, but it really struggled getting down. It's quite high. She's about 25 probably 30, 30 feet up in the tree. So lions can get up there, but they do struggle with the really high sort of elevations that the leopards get to. And Pride Cat Mama would like to know the advantages and disadvantages of solitary hunting. The advantages are that you get to eat the meat on your own. That is one. Uh, disadvantages are that if you get injured, sick, uh, unwell, whatever it might be, there's no one to assist. There's no sick days when you're a solitary animal. No sick days when you're a solitary animal. No way of calling in and saying, I'm sorry, folks, I'm not coming into work today. You have to continue as you are. So that is one of the biggest drawbacks of being a solitary hunter is that there's no one to help and their survival is completely dependent on their own wits and energy and fitness. And that's why lions that are full, full prey or full injured to buffalo or whatever it might be manage to survive and do very, very well because their, their family does the hunting and they always are allowed a little bit of the meal. But if a leopard gets injured in any way, Firstly, it will, they will struggle to, to hunt, and third, secondly, they'll struggle to hoist anything up the trees. That's why if they ever are surprised on a kill on the ground, they always will move off. Initially, they might come back and secure that kill again, but initially they move off to prevent any, any injury or bite to the back leg or to any part that will prevent them from being able to hoist or to climb. A leopard that cannot climb is done for. They will not be able to escape from wild dogs or, or lions or hyena, which will at any given opportunity try and try and dispatch a, a leopard. If it cannot climb, it will, they will always attempt to, 
to chase and catch them. The competition, the interspecific competition between the species is immense out here. And the leopard's one saving grace is their ability to get up and high up into the canopy of a tree. Okay, so from our busy leopard, let's go over to Brent with something that's very busy on the ground. We're just having a look at these ants, and look, there we go, there's one carrying a... Oh, he fell in! There we go, carrying sand out of their hole. And these ants are absolutely minute. I mean, a tiny, 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 tiny. Uh, I'm trying to think of what I can use as a reference. Let me find something here quickly. But they are incredible. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but they look like African thief ants to me, um, which is one of the smallest ant species. But it's very difficult to tell unless I can see one of the, uh, the adults. Uh, the adults look like red driver ant adults, but they're black. Now, I'm just going to... Tell me when, though. You can see how small these guys are. I put my thumb. You can see how small these little ants are. So they're absolutely tiny. So African thief ants, they look, I'm not, a, as I said, I'm not 100% sure, but they look like African thief ants to me. Yeah, so you can see they're actually taking little bits of loose soil um, and also excrement. Uh, they'll actually carry it out of the den and dump it. And uh, they've created this monster mound for these tiny little, tiny little creatures. Now, as I say, they look like African thief ants. And African thief ants are quite cool because they are one of the natural controlling agents of termites. So when an adult African thief ant leaves its nest um, as a flying ant to go set up a new colony, they are probably a thousand to two thousand times bigger than the worker ants. And uh, they will take two to three hundred of these tiny ants clinging onto their body as they take off to start a new colony. And uh, they normally set up their colony uh, near any form of termite mound, and there are quite a few around us. And the thing is, those workers are so small, they go into the termite mounds, and what happens is the termites don't even realize that they're there. Oh, you have an African thief and on. There we go. Off you jump. Off you jump. There we go. Back on the ground. Um, they don't, don't even realize that they're there. So they'll go into the... <laughs> Danny says the ants are making me itchy. Uh, but what will happen is they'll go into the termite colonies and they'll actually steal larvae and eggs from the termites. But they are so small that the soldier termites don't notice them. Now, Danny, something that will make you itchy has picked up on our vibrations while we've been sitting here and is marching straight towards us to try latch on to our bodies. And it is a tick. So it's picked up, and I've been watching it while I was talk uh, talking about the ants, and it's come from a good couple of meters away, heading straight towards us. And you can see there's a couple of ants around collecting stuff as well. But that 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 tick is making a beeline for my knee at the moment. So I think I'm going to be sensible and stand up before it gets to me. Here we go. Okay. Well, we're going to keep moving, keep checking if Hosanna is come back uh, while we do that. Let's go to Taylor, who's also got something small with six legs, not eight. It does, it does. This time around, this little critter has got all its legs intact. The last time we found one of these, I assume it's a nymph of a grasshopper. It's quite small still. It was missing one. It was also in a lion sighting, but it jumped onto the steering wheel. So I thought we'd have a look. It's beautiful, hey? All these different colors. Now, these are incredible little creatures. And the fact that they're able to leap almost about 30 times their own size, which is pretty spectacular. I wish we were able to do that. My goodness, I'd be jumping everywhere. I wouldn't be doing bush walks. I'd be doing jump walks in the bush. <laughs> but very pretty. Yeah. Look at all those contrasting colors. The bright red antenna. The sort of, his eyes look a little bit purple. 
And then look at those little spikes on the back of its leg. Look at that. It's got very big legs. Look, it's turning slowly for you. It's modeling. Well done. You get 10 points for listening, little grasshopper, or whatever you are. I don't know what type of grasshopper it is, I must be honest. So maybe you can all help me. Or we can take some screenshots, of course, and I'll look at my insect book later and see if I can find it. But like I said, I think it is a little one still. I think it's not quite an adult. It will get there eventually. But I don't know why its legs are so far apart like this. Like it's doing the splits, which is bizarre. I don't understand. I'm also trying to get a different look here. Why are you doing that? And then the way that it moves as well, dancing, bobbing from one side to the other. I don't know why they do that. And now, are you cleaning yourself, brushing your teeth? I've got funny little feet as well. They're like yellow. Now, Nikki, you were wondering if the black dot in its eye is its pupil. I'm not sure. I actually am not sure about the eyesight and the eye structure of a grasshopper. It looks like they've got compound eyes. Perhaps it is the pupil, but I'm not. I'm unfortunately not 100% sure, but it is quite cool. I've noticed that with most of the grasshoppers, in fact, and it's terrible of me. I should have looked it up sometimes. I can also be a little bit slack. I do apologize. So we'll be having a look. We've got lots of homework for this afternoon safari. Okay, very nice. Well, shall we see um, if this grasshopper will stay with us? No. Nope. I think it thought I was going to eat it and it hopped away. I was trying to have a closer look. That was so cool. I love it when little things like that jump up towards us and it sat so nice here, especially the way that it pivoted. It was very cool. Now, Dr. Rob, great to hear from you again. You've asked if uh, Hemsburg ever visit the Kruger. I've never seen one. I'm, I don't think that they occur in this area. They're more of a desert-dwelling um, animal, uh, more so than anything. And they introduced them down in the Eastern Cape to some of the private game reserves. But again, it's not their natural habitat. They should be in Namibia, trekking through the sand dunes. But I suppose all the animals out here are pretty good at adapting. So, no, they shouldn't naturally occur in this area. Uh, I'm sure they would do just fine, though. I mean, they'd probably be quite happy. There's lots of things for them to eat here. They wouldn't have to eat melons and, I suppose, I don't know, what else does a hemsbok eat when you're in the desert? Little succulents and things. There's not much out there, is there? Pockets of food. They've also got to travel huge distances constantly looking for for food. But it would be nice to have, of course, a Hemsburg shirt, but I don't think that that has happened. Right, Brent has been looking for elephants all morning on foot. He's got them. So we were actually engrossed in the small world and I heard a, a branch break. And it's actually a big herd. There's probably 25 or 30 of them. See, there's more coming through now, Dave, to the left. Uh, we're about 40 or 50 meters away from them. And a big breeding herd. Here she goes, big female up front. Now, we've made our way towards a nice big termite mound. I think she's aware that we're here. I think she spotted me while I was on the ground. So we moved away. But, again, it's very important to watch their behavior because she's carrying on eating. She can't really smell us. The wind is in our favor at the moment, but I'm pretty sure she heard me talking. She actually started coming towards where I was sitting on the ground. I had to have a closer look, but now she's she's decided no threat here, and the rest of the herd are coming through. It is always incredible to be with elephants on foot. Having a good ear rub, you see it, Dave? Um, the one on the there, I think I found a nice, found a nice tree to have a scratch on. Now Maureen's wondering. Oh, can you hear them talking to each other? Maureen is wondering, 
do any of these animals have tracking collars? Uh, there are some animals that will come through that have tracking collars, Maureen, but the vast majority don't. The ones that have tracking collars, specifically elephant and buffalo, and wild dog actually, are all part of ongoing studies, uh, mostly from the Kruger National Park, and of course there's no fence between us and the Kruger. Oh, look at that! He's having the best rub! Oh, that's so nice! <laughs> Hello and welcome to one of the most magnificent parts of the world, the Sabi Sands Game Reserve in the Greater Kruger, South Africa. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I've got Dave on camera and we're about 40 meters from a massive herd of elephants. Oh, they've just come out into the open. There we go. There's probably about 25 to 30 elephants spread through the bush willow thickets. We've been looking for leopard and we came across elephants. Now uh, there's some more about to come out into the open with some little ones now. Now we're up high on a termite mound, um, making sure we're safe, the wind's in our favor. The elephants have no idea we are here. There's a tiny little baby coming. Oh, he's, he's so small, he's even below the grass. Wow, that is amazing. Of course, you've always got to be very careful with, with breeding herds of elephants on foot. And the mothers can become very protective of their babies. Uh, so they can get aggressive. So we always make sure we're in a safe position. Now, as I said, there's quite a few of them here. Just slowly going about their business. We don't want to let them know we're here. Sonia would like to know, do you bring peanuts for the baby? No, Sonia, these are wild elephants. If I tried to give the baby peanuts, the mom would make me as flat as a pancake. So, no, we don't. We don't at all feed animals out here in the wild. This is a completely natural ecosystem. System. It's 2.7 million hectares or about so over 5 million acres of unfenced wilderness that is just for people to enjoy the animals. And there's also large tracks where they can never, ever, well, people never go and uh, they go to see that, see the wild animals. Sorry, my earpiece fell out there. Beth is wondering, do the female elephants have tusks? Yes, Beth, both male and female elephants have tusks, and uh, they use them in their everyday life to strip bark off trees. Uh, it's a very useful tool, uh, along with their trunk, that aids in their feeding. The males will use their, their tusks for, for stripping bark and for digging up clay, but they will also uh, use them for fighting. Now, we're going to get one or two last views of these ellies as they disappear into the thickets. We're not going to go any closer. Yaki says good morning from India. Well, good morning from Africa. Now, I was actually looking at something really, really small and tiny, and then I heard the elephants coming, and we had to move out of the way. But I found a spider I've never seen before. That doesn't happen too often, so it's always very exciting. But I have never seen a spider like that. So the elephants were heading there, so I actually took the spider with me. I'll put him back on his bush afterwards. But look at that. I've never seen this type of spider, so I'm going to have to go do some homework to try to figure out what type of spider it is. So it looks like it's thorns. Now, the reason it looks like it's thorn is it's probably quite tasty. So it looks like a thorn to try to stop the birds and other things eating it. And these type of spiders that have this type of uh, sort of camouflage uh, are mostly nocturnal. 
So what they'll do is they'll spin their web at night, catch all the night flying insects. Now they use a lot of energy and a lot of protein when they spin their webs. So what they'll do is just at sunrise, as the sun starts to rise, they will actually eat their web to regain that protein. There we go. And eat their protein um, and then hide on a little branch like this during the day to avoid attack by birds and other insects or uh, other insects and other or even mammals so I'm gonna go pop this spider back on its branch where I found it but it has been great having you live on foot in the African bush but you never know when you go live again so watch out for those notifications who knows next time I could be on foot with a leopard so bye for now Now, how amazing is this spider, guys? It is incredible. I have never, ever seen a spider like that. I'm going to have to take some photos of it and uh, send it off to some people who know a lot more about spiders than I do. How cool. I, I'm pretty sure it's related to... A bird dropping spiders and that these camouflage spiders that are mostly nocturnal anyway I'm gonna go stop get some pictures of it uh, see if I can try get an ID on it from one of my friends who's a spider expert in the meantime let's go back to the beautiful shidulu thank you Brent how amazing for you to be on foot with a breeding herd of elephants I'm sure he is super excited to be back in the Sabi sands to be able to be on foot with not only elephants, but whatever else might materialize as we were lucky enough and fortunate enough to have this young female on foot yesterday, which definitely made made my week and the beginning of a cat a day, which was marvelous. And she is slowly, but constantly feeding and it is nearly finished. Cecilia wants to know what the can you say that again about cleaning off the ticks, Nick? Sorry, cleaning off the ticks off itself. I wonder. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, cats Cats will not allow oxpeckers near them. They will, the oxpeckers, it's, it's a risk that they would take. Um, if you see how animals or cats respond to anything that comes nearby, they swat and grab and eat. So any ox pecker out there that lands on a lion or a leopard would end up being a leopard or lion meal. I've seen a lion sitting in the long grass and a quail came nearby and it swatted it and munched it there and then on the spot. So anything that lands on a leopard will probably be the last landing it ever does. And anyone that attempted to in the past that landed on a cat was not able to breed and hence its lineage ended there and then. So impala are the smallest antelope that I'm aware of that allow oxpeckers on. <laughs> Charles wants to know when leopards groom each other, do they eat the parasites? I'm not sure if they actually eat them, um, but they will grab them off with teeth. You don't often find leopards grooming each other. A cub will be groomed by its mother, but lions definitely groom each other. And whether they eat the, the tick or not, is un, I'm unsure. I haven't actually seen them physically chewing them. But something you see monkeys and baboons doing, they pick the ticks off and they do actually just pop them in their mouth like, like sweets. There's a little bit of a delicacy, their little blood fetish for the day. A bit of arachnid and blood at the same time. A marvelous little treat. And at the same time, dealing with the, the aloe grooming is very part and parcel of the social behavior of those animals and talking about baboons it's very interesting how their grooming behavior can almost be related to or compared to that of a prison gang and younger and smaller or weaker individuals will actually do favors for larger males within the troop so as to get their favor when times are tough or when they are being abused and beaten by a more sort of dominant male than themselves, they'll often call on the favors of those more dominant males that they've been uh, sort of looking after in the past. So 
quite interesting if you do watch baboon behavior and try and compare it to that of a prison gang and the favors that are are sort of passed around from youngster to adult but leopards will do most of the grooming for themselves so those ticks on the back of her neck she'll either scratch off or they will fall off and breed soon Hello, proud cat mama once again. You'd like to know what part of a kill has the most nutrients? Well, generally the internal organs, such as the liver and the kidneys, those tend to have, or I think the liver in its own, has generally got most of the, the iron and whatever it is that the leopard will benefit from most. But then also, when they're able to break open the bones and get the marrow, the marrow is very, very nutritious and very, very good for the leopard. But then obviously all the meat is very, very tasty. And as we saw earlier, she really enjoyed the cheek. Now, I've quite often seen cats feeding on cheeks of animals. I don't quite know why. What is there in the cheek that is so delicious and so tasty? It's very hard to say, really, but there's practically nothing left of this Dacre. She's got one leg and a little bit of a hip joint, I think. I'm not actually sure anymore. It's hidden by the branch. The rest of it has fallen. Will she go down and reclaim what she's dropped? Those hyena that we're calling have not come anywhere near the scene. Hello, Gizmo. You'd like to know how long she's been eating for? Well, we left her this morning. Uh, yesterday morning, we had her at about... Let me have just have a look at the time now. We had her at about... 10 past 6 yesterday morning and then Scott followed her from where we found her on foot and probably about half an hour 45 minutes after that so about 7 o'clock or so yesterday morning it is now um, 20 to 8 in South African time so about an hour earlier yesterday is when she found this Dacre and then she took it up the tree so she's been with it since about 7 maybe 7.30 yesterday morning so about 24 hours she's been with this, this carcass and this is the second time we've been with her and she's been feeding since we've been with her this morning she's practically been feeding for about an hour already and yesterday we were with her before we left safari last night she was feeding also for about 45 minutes to an hour and during the night we have no idea no idea how much time she spent on the on the kill itself but she has not stopped for about an hour she's been munching away crunching the bones enjoying her breakfast a very hearty meal indeed okay so we're going to stay here with this crunching bone and see what happens after she dispatches the final fragments of this day could let's go back over to brent with his spider what a marvelous specimen let's see what it is well it is just so unusual and uh, Dave Dean says it looks like it could be a hedgehog spider uh, that could definitely be a hedgehog spider it's it's, a, it's an apt name if it is but uh, as I say um, if anyone can find any more information on it that would be great It could also be um, one of the orb weaver spiders. I think I think the hedgehog spider is not quite the same, but you do have quite a lot of variance in 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 these things. Um, but it's going to be, oof, I think it's going to be a tough one. That is incredible. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the hedgehog spider is probably the most likely for now, but as I said, I'm going to, I'll get hold of a, a proper spider expert and we can be a hundred percent sure. But Dave Dean, I think you might be onto something there with the hedgehog spider. Isn't that incredible? So 
absolutely stunning. All right, well, we're going to put our spider back in the tree and go for a, a, a stroll further down the road now that the elephants have moved off a bit. And while we do that, let's see where Taylor is bumbling about. Not much, unfortunately. Uh, we are not winning at the safari game today, but that's okay. There was a squirrel. I don't know if it's going to stay there. Probably not. Uh, there we go. You got it. Blending in very well. And it looks like it's holding a marula nut. Run, run, run. Off it goes. Down the road. Bye. Oh, squirrel, thanks for showing yourself, though, because I was like the first animal we've seen in some time. I was losing hope. I thought they'd all gone on holiday. So, yeah, so Craig and I are just bobbing and weaving. Uh, those male leopard tracks basically just disappear again. Uh, the ones that were on Cheetah Cut Line, I don't know where they went. And there were no fresh tracks crossing in, so no tracks of Tandy. Also had a little, little scratch for her. Wasn't successful. Um, so now we've just kind of been hoping for some birds and, you know, other animals to show themselves. We're on Hyena Road now. I think this could be the first time I've driven Hyena Road since I've been back. I don't think I've been down here once for a very long time. There we go. Back up to the boundary and then I think we might move to the northern corner. Uh, it sounds like the Nkuhumas are still on Torchwood. Uh, I think, I don't actually know who found them. Someone found them. All of them are there, which is nice. It's a bit of a quiet morning, but it's okay. You know, these things happen. Sometimes it's nice just to go out and appreciate the bush and the smells and the sights and the sounds, which is lovely. It's been cool. We've seen a of things that we don't normally get to see from the car. So that's been great. But the birds are even high away from me. Luckily, luckily I did not challenge Brent to a birding competition today. Because we, we know that that's great. Because he's on the car again, he'll be challenging all of us one of them we let him win though don't tell him that we just pretend we can't find birds so it makes him happy <laughs> uh because i would have lost that competition today as well because i've seen like a whole of seen a few flying across but none that want to sit for very long and that's the whole thing with the bird you gotta put it on camera otherwise it doesn't count but it can be quite tricky yeah let's actually look back at me people have driven down like oh there's an inyala what I was going to say is it doesn't look like many people have driven down this road. It's quite quiet. As I say that, all the animals now pop out. Hello, Miss Daniela Bull. You're quite beautiful. Lovely horns. But please don't turn away. No. Come back. Come back here, please. Okay, well, seeing as where the hornbill's gone. Craig, on the left, I don't know if you can you see that hornbill in that... What is that tree? Oh, it's sitting in something. Here we go. A yellow-billed hornbill, oh, it's sitting in a quarry, and hopping around on a very flimsy branch. It always amazes me, the bird's balance and how they can just sit on the smallest of small branches. Oh, it's coming closer. What are you looking for? Looking for little insects? Shimming its way down? What has it got there? Dude, it's got something in its mouth. I don't know if it's eating the berries. Yes, maybe. Oh, it does look like it's actually... Nibbling on a few little berries. Are you? Are you looking for the insects that could be drawn to the fruit? Let's see. I can't say I've ever really watched yellow-billed hornbills feasting on too much fruit. It is indeed eating it, though. Mmm. Delicious. I mean, they're predominantly insectivores. They're mainly feeding on insects. Anything that they can catch. But I suppose a little bit of fruit never did anybody any harm. Unlike the cousins, the crowned hornbills and the trumpeters, which we can also sometimes see here, they absolutely love fruit. And they'll feast on it whenever they get the opportunity. I might have to go chase that hornbill away, though, so I can have a quarry berry. Hey, Craig, stop eating all the red ones. Save some for us. Because I always tell you, oh, it's one of my favorite fruits. And it is too. It's only going for the... No, that you have the other ones. We're also hungry. <laughs> Quite funny to watch, in fact. All on its own, no partner. Normally you see them in pairs, too. But a very cool little bird. And bye-bye. Off it goes. Very nice. Let's go get some berries. Seeing as though the hornbill decided to leave, I didn't even have to chase it away. I'm going to eat the rest of them now. Mmm. Very nice. Well, 
I'm going to find the red berries. It's going to be hard because that hornbill has eaten them all. Craig and I are going to tuck into this quarry tree. And I'm going to send you to Steve for a DNC. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. Um, don't eat too many of the guari seeds. Apparently, they can make you quite excited. So, folks, we've moved out of the Shadulu female sighting, the young leopard, just to give some of the other other landowners and game viewers a bit of a chance. We're going to see if we can go follow up on the tracks of those buffalo, because it seems as if no one is interested in following them. So, let's go see where they've gone to. By the the look of their tracks, they're probably heading down towards Treehouse Dam, but that's just kind of what I saw. Buffalo move in response to water and food, and there's lots of food around, so the direction that they're moving probably in relation to some form of water. So the best option is to go and have a look. If they're going to Vuyatela Dam, they would have headed that way, but they're heading sort of, yeah, here's some dung just there on the road. Jane would like to know how they fuel up the gas tanks. Are you talking about our, our vehicles, Jane? Uh, we have jerry cans, 20 litre 20 liter petrol containers that we, uh, that we fill up. We pick them up in town every so often whenever we go there. There's quite a few staff movements. We go through to Hoodsprate. It's about an hour or so drive. We head through there and we, we get water, first of all. We get uh, sort of reverse osmosis water and then petrol and all sorts of other interesting things that we might need in camp. Uh, we do have a food delivery that comes through once a week but for them to bring fuel for us would be quite wrong because they come with a refrigerated truck so to bring fuel in there would just wouldn't work. So yeah we get we get quite often like for example Jerry has gone through to to that side last night to fetch one of our other staff members Alicia who will be back today. Um, and so she went and spent the night, but we have staff movements quite regularly to and from town. Okay, so there is the, the dung pile of a buffalo. This is what we came across this morning. If I just show you in the road there, I'm going to jump off for a second. Sands is going to show you the dung. You can see that black spot above my shoulder. And then the multitude of buffalo tracks heading in that direction so that is the general direction they're going and very very easy to identify a buffalo dung because it's very moist very flat called a patty and the the tracks if you can see them that is the hoof heading in that direction so we're going to follow up sort of that way buffalo probably the easiest animals in the african bush to follow because they just leave a trail of dung behind them and you could almost follow the, the flies just to smell them and follow them. I know guests in the past have always been very amazed at my ability to track and find buffalo, but it is not that hard, folks. It's not that hard. They move in relation to food and water, and as I said, they leave dung and a multitude of tracks. So while we see if we can follow up and find these beautiful buffalo, let's go over to Taylor, who's got a very small crepuscular bird. We do. I don't know how I managed to spot it after I was just complaining about how we haven't been seeing any animals. Hyena Road seems to be the road where I should have started my drive. But anyways, here we have a little pearl spotted owlet. Just found its perch in a silver clust leaf. And that's where it is going to sit for the rest of the day. Craig, can we show everyone how far away that is? Just have a look at this. I still don't know how I saw that. Because that's very far away. Where, where we go? My eyes are actually working today. That's a surprise. Now, I was for a moment, I actually thought, my goodness, is it a pearl spotted owlet? Or is it a barred owlet? Because I couldn't remember the differences. It's been a long time uh, since I've uh, seen either. But you can see as it turns its head, it's got the little black spots on the back of its head. But um, also a very, very streaky breast. Prominent yellow eyes, and I that love that little white eyebrow that it looks like they have. Come on, look at us now, so we can show everybody what you're talking about. What we talking about? Come on, look at us. What? Keeps wanting to look away. Come here. Yeah, you can see. Hey, just going round and round and round. Come back here. <laughs> That's keeping keeping an eye on it. Six o'clock. That's so cool. 
Well, they can't quite turn their head 360 degrees, but it's close. That's amazing. It's actually facing us. The body is facing us. Looking down on the ground. Perhaps it's taking advantage of the cooler, cloudy day. And that's what it actually looks like what it's doing at the moment. It looks like it's looking on the ground. Now, when pearl spotted owlets hunt, I mean, they're not flying around trying to necessarily flush any prey out. Um... Oh, I can hear hyenas. Can you hear that? I'm pretty sure Brent will be able to hear it, but there's definitely whooping. Or Brent is playing a joke on us. You can hear it, Greg. It's pretty loud. I'm, so, I'm sorry that you can't hear it. Only one on the move and calling. Anyways, that'll be the next. That'll be the next thing that we go and investigate. Anyways, so what I was saying is that this little owl is sat on its little perch and staring down into the grass. I think, hoping that a little rodent of sorts will flush out of the grass, and then I'm pretty sure it will take advantage. Like I said, it's cool, it's overcast, and um, so it's kind of like it's hunting in the very early morning, which is quite nice. Oh, off it goes. It's just flown all the way down over there. I don't think we'll be able to get it there. Eh? Thank you, Sharon, for the lovely compliment. You said that I've got an amazing, I've got amazing eyesight. Uh, I think sometimes I just get lucky. But um, let me try to turn in here. Uh, when you have been working in the bush for a long time, your eyes definitely do start to pick up the smaller things and things that don't belong. Like there, I could clearly see at the edge of a branch. There was something on the end, and I was like, well, they don't get any big fruit, or and that's a bizarre spot for an ant to make its nest. Well, Herbie and I were just having a chat about tracking. Herbie, don't run away. Come back here, Herb. Don't run away from me, Herb. We're just having a chat about tracking. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't found any leopard tracks, so we're going, we're just having having a nice chat about tracking while we're keeping an eye out for everything and uh, so it's all, it's always great to spend time with herb on foot it's an absolute pleasure he is one of the true gentlemen uh, of the world herbie so absolute pleasure to be back out with herbs smile herb <laughs> so what what we're trying to do is if hasana has come back it's going to be in this last stretch that we're on here and uh, on shabam road because that open area where my brother said he was going was just over here. Oh, what have we got? Juvenile bat. Yeah, Dave. Some, oh. Some time to put Dave to the test. Here we go. Nice Darvikins. Darvikins, that's a tree. <laughs> Hi, Kayleen. Oh, he's back, Dave. <laughs> I love torturing cameramen. It's an art. Nice, Davey. Whoops. Panic at the disco. Okay, I'll stop torturing you now, Dave. Um, so, Kayleen was wondering, what is the smallest cat out here? Uh, it is the African wild cat. It is the smallest cat that occurs naturally in this part of South Africa. There is one smaller cat species that lives up to the north and uh, the west and that's a black-footed cat which is more an arid desert species so there we go that's the smallest cat now the other small cats we get here are caracal um, which is also known as a lynx sometimes in south africa and they've got the long tufts of hair on top of their ears and then of course serval is another another small cat we get here uh, we don't see them too often here um, serval we saw a lot in the mara Ooh. Nicole's wondering what animal have I never seen that I would really like to. Well, I've been quite lucky. I think, um, yeah, uh, in the Sabi Sands Kruger, I've seen them all. <laughs> I'm quite lucky like that. Um, but in in other parts of Africa, there's lots of stuff I'd love to see. So uh, when I was working in the rainforests, I never got to see a golden cat. 
um, which I got. I caught them on camera trap, but I never actually got to see one uh, with my own eyes. So that's a, definitely an animal I'd like to see. Uh, what else would I really like to see? A golden cat. Um, just trying to think of some forest. Oh, giant pangolin. So I've seen uh, the two species of tree pangolin, I've seen the ground pangolin, but I've never seen the giant camera, uh, pangolin. Another one we caught on camera trap, so they're probably about double to triple the size of our, our ground pangolin. And uh, really, really cool thing about them is that they, and which makes them very difficult to see, is one of the, uh, well, the ants that they eat a lot of live in trees in swamp forests. Uh, so they actually spend a lot of time swimming from tree to tree to get to the ant nests they like to feed off. So, and that's a definitely giant pangolin. And then of course in the rest of the world, tigers, jaguars, snow leopard, clouded leopard, uh, Sumatran rhino, orangutan. Um, I mean, you, I could just keep going uh, in the rest of the world. So there's lots, lots to see. And oh, another one in Africa that I really want to see is the Ethiopian wolf, um, or yeah, that's uh, of the highlands of Ethiopia. Now, a very cool thing about the Ethiopian wolf, so it lives very high, and unfortunately, um, they are very endangered. It's the most endangered canid in the world. They're even less Ethiopian wolves than they are wild dogs, and uh, they feed almost exclusively on rodents. And an, a nice little interesting fact about the, the Ethiopian highlands, the rodent density up there, sorry, track, uh, it's a civet, 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 um, not a very clear track, otherwise I would show you, but the rodent density up there is so incredible that in terms of biomass, in terms of food, meat, uh, internal organs, etc., it, there are mo there's more biomass in the rodent populations uh, in the Bale Mountains than there are in the whole migration. So 1.7 wildebeest, 200,000 zebra, 200,000 Thompson's gazelle is less meat than the rats in the Bale Mountains. And they've got some really giant mats up there. So it's all alpine heath and alpine grassland. Uh, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, so that's definitely something that's actually quite high up on my list of things to do. Okay, so unfortunately no sign of the little chief crossing back in. Um, so I'm not sure where we're going to go next. Herbie and I are going to have a discussion, a meeting, decide where to go. And while we do that, let's go back to Steve, who's bumbling about. Yes, we are bumbling. We've just found a wider long-tailed paradise. Just a big loop there to see if we can see where the buffalo have gone and I believe there's a nice discussion on what animals have we not seen we'd like to see I have seen a pangolin before which was super cool but I would like to see another one after Brent's discussion yesterday of the black leopard that he saw both Sens and myself are kind of in that mindset sorry Sens there's the wire that just landed here the mindset with oh he's gone again he's not playing he's not playing the game for us right now unfortunately sorry about that he's moved off but both sends and I would like to see a black leopard. I've never seen a striped polecat. That's something I'd love to see. Striped polecat. I would also really enjoy going to India and seeing a wild tiger. I think that for me would be quite incredible. And I, I had a chat with a friend of mine, an Indian student that I had who's actually working in Sri Lanka. And he just got back from somewhere where he saw some snow leopards. That is something I would absolutely kill to see. Um, Brent mentioning the Ethiopian wolf, another animal that is very, very, I think it's the most endangered carnivore on the African continent. That would be something to see. I've watched a couple documentaries on them and they seem to be quite a special little animal. And then I think finally I would like to see a polar bear in the wild. Mm, wouldn't that be something? Polar bear. I wouldn't know what to do with the polar bear. I think I'd be quite terrified there's something about a polar bear that I do not understand. They are just enormous, enormous, enormous animals. I've only seen them in a zoo and that just doesn't do it justice. But I'd like to see one in the wild before um, conditions don't allow that anymore. Because as we know, the ice sheets are disappearing. So those buffalo don't seem to have come out at all. 
I'm going to go back up this road. I'm sure we're going to get the tracks at some point. <laughs> Max, <laughs> Max, what an interesting discussion. I think this is something we should pose to all the presenters this morning. Max would like to know if tigers were introduced to Juma, would it cause chaos? Max, wow, tigers would do some serious, they do some serious stuff here. I don't know what the Unkuhumas would have to say about that, but um, the leopards, I think, would, would not know what hit them. Tigers, wow, I think that would be quite something to behold. I honestly don't know a lot about tigers. I've watched some documentaries, but it's not an animal I've spent too much time studying. But they would, yo, I know John Varty has brought tigers into Africa, into South Africa, somewhere in the Free State, and they kill and they kill, and they are just a phenomenal, phenomenal predators. Um, but naturally in the African wilderness, I'm sure they'll do well, but what chaos they would cause with the other predators out here is something that would be very interesting to study. But I don't know what the Nkuhumas would think about a tiger prancing around in their territory. I reckon they'd have a lot to say about it. But um, marvelous discussion topic. I'm sure Brent would have something to say about that. Should we ask him next? What do you think about Tiger's introduction to Juma and the chaos? Tiger's entering Juma. What a story that would be. <laughs> okay, Brent says he's got tracks of Ukumuri. Whereabouts is he next? I don't know what block they're working in at the moment. Okay, okay, okay. So Brenton, Herbie are somewhere over there with tracks of Ukumuri asking me to keep my eyes peeled. I am indeed. I will let you know if we see anything. But uh, these buffalo seem to have just vanished. Maybe they are bedded down within the block. They have not gone to drink any water. But uh, we will see. We had their tracks from when last we saw you. Then they came across that central. Let me do it again. So where we first saw them, we showed you just over here. Sorry, let me put it there. Just over here were the tracks. And then we came around this block of quarantine and their tracks were directly there, the dung. And sort of the bee line is there to treehouse. But uh, we haven't seen them come across. We are over here now having a look. So it's possible that they have given us a bit of a skip. We're going to do another little loop here and see maybe where they might have, have crossed and then but it seems to me that they're headed straight towards Treehouse Dam. So we'll have another little look here and then straight on down there. I have no doubt we will find them. Buffalo in Juma are always quite nice and Brent and Herbie might want to keep their eyes peeled because buffalo on foot are always quite special. I do enjoy it. Lots of elephant activity though and tracks. Cat Bragg uh, wants to know about a polecat. Stripe polecat, I think it is a weasel. It looks very much like a skunk. It's black with a white down on the back. Um, but I don't know, it's not, not a weasel. It looks similar to a weasel. Maybe I should just show you a picture. Let's quickly just switch off there. Polecat, otherwise known as a Zorilla. Polecat 44. There we go. There is the striped polecat on the top. Very funny looking thing. I have no idea actually too much about it. I've never seen one in my life. I haven't spent too much time studying them. It's an animal that you don't see very often. Um, Herbie assures me that we get them here. He actually pulled me up to a tree one day and said, can you smell that? And I couldn't quite put my finger on the smell. And apparently that was the smell of a striped polecat. It was a sort of a sweet sort of aroma. but. I wouldn't probably be able to identify it again. It's, uh, I probably wouldn't, but it's giving off that. Okay, thank you, Lou. Isn't it marvelous? We've got the FC uh, on their fingers and their computers, and they have told us that the striped polecat is in the weasel family. So that answers your question. They do have quite a noxious smell, apparently. That black and white is to indicate two predators don't eat me, I taste very bad, apparently. Should we go that way, Sens? 
No, we're not going to go that way. I don't even think that's a road. Look like a road, probably an old sighting. Okay, so we've done a big loop and there's no buffalo coming out, which means they've given us a little bit of a skip. But don't worry, we'll go back down this way. Oh, why don't we just frame that beautiful bird before we link across? Let's frame. Oh, he doesn't want to be framed. There was a beautiful lilac breasted royal that was just sitting there. But he doesn't want to be on the camera this morning. So we're going to go over to Taylor, who is driving, and we will catch up with you shortly. Finally, the gremlins have left us alone this morning. Gremlins, I mean, the technical difficulties with the signal sometimes on some of the dodgy roads. Hyena Road seems to be one of them. Um, so we haven't really found anything since our owl. That was a very productive road. I tried to find a hyena that was whooping in the distance, but I had no luck there either. Now, I don't even know what road I'm on anymore. Maybe Drac? No, I don't know. Oh, no, I'm on Central. I, I do know where I am. <laughs> ah, for a moment, I, had, I couldn't remember where I was, but I do now. We're actually going to come up on Drakensberg. Tundi loves it around here, so that's of course what we're looking for. Now, as we drive about, we're going to see some people, so I'm just actually going to just pull off the road and we're going to answer the question, and then we'll let them go past. Maureen, you were wondering if people live on the reserve 24-7. Yes, they do. I'm one of them. Craig is also one of them, and uh, the girls in Final Control are them too, and uh, it's, it's quite cool, in fact. All the anti-poaching teams, anyone that works on the reserves, typically we, we consider the lodge or the lodge that you work at your home. So there, there's always someone here. The lodges never close, and if they do, it's not for a particular thing either. So here we go. Okay, those people that went past, we let them go past. Now we can carry on with our safari. Um, I have seen lots and lots of elephant tracks, so that's promising. Perhaps we're going to bump into them. I wouldn't mind spending the rest of the morning with a big herd of elephants. Actually, I wouldn't mind spending the rest of the morning with a cheeky young elephant. I think that could be quite cool. I heard Daryl was back too. I don't know where he was though. I think Brent had him. Mmm. Now, mm, this is a tricky one. And it's a question from Ashlyn and said, if I could spend all my time with one animal, which animal would it be? Ashlyn, I think I'm going to have to choose the elephants. Again, like it's normally my answer to most of the questions is elephants. Uh, so yeah, so just because they, they're so entertaining watching all the, all the, pretty much the entire herd interact with one another is quite special too. Watching them feed is always quite fascinating. Dig for water, drinking water, swimming in the water, all of those things. I feel like you don't need too much of an explanation for, for that one. But they're just always on the go. They're always doing something. I mean, every now and then you'll find yourself seeing elephants standing still, not even swishing their tails around anymore under the shade of a marula tree. On a, there it is. There's the hyena. Yay! They can chase you around the whole property. You get back here, you filthy hyena. It is literally filthy. It's covered in mud at the moment. There it goes, running down the road. Look back here, please, so we can see who you are. Look, if I get too close, it's going to get stinky. So I'm pretty sure this is the same hyena that was whooping in the distance. Uh, hot on it. Oh, no. I thought something broke for a second. False alarm. It didn't. Let's go see where the hyena's going. Maybe it will lead us somewhere. Hopefully it doesn't go off the road though. And with all the thick vegetation around them, I would assume it's just going to carry on down this lovely clear road. There's no point for it. We're going to stop and watch it again. There you go. We'll just keep doing this. We'll give it some room and as to not push it off of the road. And sometimes if you do get a bit close, the animals will just move right on off. But we've got a huge gap between this hyena. Where are you off to? Just marching along. Not going anywhere too quickly. Oh, there we go. 
stop briefly to pause and have a look at us. Uh, Carol, you said that the elephants have uh, fast become your favorite animal since starting watching Safari Live. Uh, they are. They they often do that to people. I mean, a lot a lot of people are scared of elephants, which will, you should be. You should have a healthy respect for them. Um, but once you understand their behaviour, and you can you can read the different signs, they're not too intimidating. But of course, you must be very very careful of them. Right? Hyena's going around the corner, so we need to head on forward. No, stalling. Now, Wisteria, you said you think that hyena's got a full belly. I think it does as well. I don't know when it or what it was feeding on. Maybe it hunted for itself. Perhaps it scavenged off of a carcass. I haven't got a clue. But it does look full. So we'll just... Mm, we're going to go up a little bit further now because the road keeps bending here, so there's no point in us stopping right now. It will disappear. It's now broken into a trot. Off it goes. We are coming up to... The boundary, however, to Torchwood, we won't be able to follow it. Maybe it's on its way to the Lions, to the Nkuhuma Pride. Okay, I'll stop up here again. There we go. Now, Yvette, you said you thought that the hyenas actually travel in, in packs. Uh, I suppose, sort of. Um, they are very social creatures. We typically wouldn't refer to it as a, a pack of hyena. We'd actually say a clan. Um, that's a normal way that we use it. But again, collective nouns, you're allowed to actually say whatever you like. Or if the hyena goes off the road, let's try and see if we can follow it. We'll watch it. Might come back on again. Um, so when they're at the den sites, they're fairly social and um, they'll all come together but it's actually not uncommon to see just one hyena on its own like this um, but of course if they are going out for a hunt we will see them in groups this one's obviously been off on its mission it's hard to tell from this angle whether it's a male or a female i mean i haven't been able to see too much of it and the females are bigger than the boys so if it is a it looks quite staunch maybe it's a female like I said, hard to tell from this angle. Um, but it, it also wouldn't surprise me if it was a male being on its own. They typically spend a lot more time by themselves. The girls ru rule the roost. Okay, we might get one last view of it here because it is crossing into Torchwood. There we go. I'm kicking up a bit of dust. And this is the last view now. We're going to have of this hyena it is crossing straight into Torchwood. Maybe those lions have made a kill <clears throat> and maybe they've moved off of their kill. Maybe that's where it's going. Perhaps there were other hyena that were calling in the distance that we just weren't able to hear. Because remember, their hearing, eyesight, sense of smell is way better than ours. And off it goes. I'm so glad we managed to find that hyena. I didn't think we were, to be honest. I thought that uh, that was going to be the end of it. I think I just thought I was just going to hear it and then, you know, be gone. But thank you, Hyena. That was awesome. Very, very nice. Short but sweet sighting. I know how you all appreciate having a view of the hyenas on Juma. We don't get to spend much time with them often, I'm afraid. Uh, we're still trying to figure out where they are denning. Now, Belinda, you're wondering if the hyena bite force is stronger than the line. You are correct. It is indeed. Hyenas have got exceptionally, exceptionally strong bite force, and, uh, and that's the reasons why they're able to feed on different parts of a carcass or an animal than, say, lions are. Uh, lions are able to crunch through certain amounts of bones, and same thing with leopards, um, but their teeth aren't really designed for it, and that's where the hyenas come in and make use of their strong and very powerful jaws and crush through the bones and get all that bone marrow which is very tasty and full of all sorts of nutrients so yeah we actually had a cool sighting with Tumba not so long ago when he killed a fully grown kudu cow and unfortunately that was rather large for him to waste in a tree but she was also pregnant so he pulled the fetus up the fetus that he had come in his kill and he was able to take a little bit of it up into the tree and hearing them tear through uh, well all flesh 
and then crunching those bones is a pretty cool sound. I quite like listening to animals feed. You don't necessarily need to see it. Close your eyes and you can just hear. Okay, so I need to hop back onto the Maybe we'll go down Mamba, have a look around there. He was also on a bubble. Okay, so we have found the tracks of the buffalo. They've come from all the way across from a... Sorry. Sorry, I'm just having a little word with Brent on the radio there. Apologies, folks. Sorry, Brent, can you just go again with that up update, please? Brent's talking to me about something. If you just hold on for a moment. Okay, he's found a kill, folks. Okay. That looks like a buffalo bottom. We found the buffalo. Comment Brent, we'll move into the area there. Thanks very much. Brent seems to have found a kill, folks, on uh, where he is at the moment. So we're going to bypass these buffalo quickly. They're having technical difficulties on the... On the they're having technical difficulties on their bushwalk, maybe because of where they are exactly. But we're going to move into that area and we're going to have a look. But we found the buffalo for you. Um, I'm just going to let everybody know. The station is located on a breeding herd of buffalo around on Twin Dams, south of Chilipan, slowly mobile towards Twin Dams itself. Okay, we're going to have a quick look at these buffalo. Do you want to get that one there, Sense? Okay, we're going to have a quick look and then we're going to go and find Brent and the kill that he's got because it's possible Hukumuri is in the area there. Wouldn't that be marvelous to see? Oh, there we go. There's a pretty, pretty, lad. pretty lad. <laughs> Which one do you want, Sense? The guy who's smashing the bushes. Look at him, hey? He is a big boy and he's showing the bush what he thinks of it. I'm really surprised that Brent and Herbie managed to to miss these tracks maybe these buffalo have been moving as we've been talking because i think he was a little bit further behind us on chelapan earlier this morning that's what i heard the first update so it's possible that these buffalo have have crossed the path after herbie and brent oh shame there's a female buffalo over there that's just disappeared into the bush that is limping quite heavily i won't really be able to see her i just saw her make her way across the road to the left there sends she's very difficult to see, but she's not a happy chappy. She's gone now, though. Not that female, but she's disappeared into the bushes. She will be easily uh, overwhelmed by the Unkuhumas if they find her. Uh, these animals, lions, will always select the easiest meal. And I think this lady thinks we owe her some money. Look at that. The typical stare the buffalo gives you. <laughs> And I don't know if you can hear it, folks. I'm just going to hold the speaker for a moment. Listen to the ox peckers coming from the thickets there. Very important to understand the call of that. Someone's calling me on the radio. Just hang on a second. Standing by. I'm making our way from Twin Dams Road. Okay, COVID. Okay, so folks, Herbie's calling me in. We're going to go and see what kill this is and then maybe find whatever leopard it might be. We will come back later to find some buffalo, but let's go and help the bushwalk team to relocate on whoever that might be. If they found a kill, I don't know what it might be. Let's try to get past these buffalo without any incident. This Dugger boy, Dugger boy meaning very muddy, muddy, muddy. And aren't you a beautiful chap? <laughs> Enormous animal. He's probably about a thousand kilograms or so of just muscle. Absolutely.
absolutely fantastic. Well done, Senzi. Dugger boy, Dugger is the local word for mud. And uh, you could see how covered he was in mud. And there was a little branch there that he was thrashing. That as we were in past, I'm sorry we didn't focus on it, but it was covered in mud from where he'd been probably rubbing his underside. Because as we know, the buffalo are covered in ticks. Um, those of us who've been enjoying not having any ticks, the buffalo are coming in more and more. And I'm pretty sure within the next few weeks, we are going to be scratching. Yvette, what was Yvette wondering? Sorry about the, the ticks, Nicks. Yes, Yvette, so the buffalo are a huge carrier of ticks, Archer, hence the, 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 uh, the following they have of, of ox peckers. The ox peckers are feeding on ticks. They can feed on about 500 large ticks a day, 1,500 nymphs every single day. And uh, so now as the buffalo moving in, there's going to be more ticks in the area. We saw the Shadulu female, how many ticks were on her. Hopefully Brent doesn't have any ticks on him, but we're going to go find the kill. Let's go over to Taylor and see what updates she has for you. Well, I've actually just seen Steve drive past on Twin Dams Road. We're on Mumba, and I've just picked up on Mumba fresh big male leopard tracks. And they look like they've got fairly long toes. And I know uh, Scott said that he thinks that the uh, when Hukumori Hukumori walks on the sand, you can kind of see his really nice long toes. And I think that may have been him. I'm trying to see if I can find another really nice track. So I'm going to move out of this Steve Wolf is coming in Brent and hopefully they get a lift for you nice. Sorry. Gremlins. I got told to keep quiet while the gremlins were attacking me. Apparently that works. If you stop talking, it's like they just don't know where you are anymore. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, off we, okay, we're going to go through here. Our signal shell. So sorry about that folks, you've lost Taylor, some gremlins, or maybe she's still got her leprechauns from yesterday. We are slowly making our way towards the, the pan just off of Shibamu Road, which I'll show you shortly on the map for those of you who are not aware of it. But that is the area where I've had Tingana set marking when I first came in January and then had Hukumuri moving in on the exact same road, set marking. And that is where Herbie and Brent are. They found a kill. I have no idea what it is. Some elephants in the distance there. But uh, sorry, Ellie's. we will come back to you. Let's go and see if we can find what it is that has made this kill. It's much easier with a vehicle, as you know. Leopards don't respond as well to us on foot as they do in the vehicle. So whoever it is in the area there, we're guessing it's Okumuri. I have no idea. I can't say that for sure. Maybe it's Osana. Ooh, Ryan, you'd like to know whose roar is loud, louder, lion or leopard? Most definitely a lion. Lion goes much further. They've got a huge base in the chest. Oh, it is a morning of animals. What can we do? There is warthog and elephant. Elephant are drinking. We are really trying to get somewhere. Folks, we are really trying to get somewhere, but the animals are just showing themselves this morning, and it is a marvelous view of this very small breeding herd. Absolutely sensational morning. But we're going to go. Have to see if we can just creep past these alleys without disturbing them. I do love elephant, but Brent does need our help. So we can always come back. We have a bit of a roadblock though. Uh oh, there she comes, the little one. High speed elephant movement. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry, Ellie's. 
Mama's on the right hand side is quite relaxed. The youngsters don't like me very much, it seems. But it's okay. You're not causing them any distress. Hello, Mama. You have got some beautiful children here. Yes, you do. Okay, I think I'm going to try and sneak through before she comes. Hang on, here we go. We're being charged from the left. Here comes the biggest of the herd. Be careful. Look at the tail. Classic elephant aggression happening right here, folks. Have a look at that. When an elephant does that with its tail, a youngster, you don't need to be too worried. But when an adult does that, they're not very relaxed. Can you see how stiff and erect that tail is? It's classic elephant behavior. Okay, well, folks, we're going to try to get past these, this elephant roadblock on this Sunday. I don't think they're in any hurry to let us through, but I believe Taylor has managed to come from the other side, and she has found the buffalo that we left just a moment ago. We have found the buffalo, and we're watching this bull. He's been very entertaining. I think he's got an itch somewhere. Look at him. He keeps rubbing over the branches. And he's trying to wedge those smaller smaller branches sort of in between his horns. So maybe there's some ticks bothering him. I know what they sometimes do is they find themselves a tamboti tree. And they'll do something like this in the bark. Look at him. Go. And often that toxin gets on the horns and will act as a an, like an insect repellent. See that? Trying to get underneath it. but sort of between his ear and the horns. I bet that must be so itchy. Now, Fern, you've asked me, how do I get the little ticks out of my hair? I hope I don't have little ticks in my hair. Um, I try to wash my hair as often as possible to avoid that. However, the animals out here, they rely on the oxpeckers to do that for them. That's a type of bird that um, hops around. We might actually see some oxpeckers. I can hear them just chatting away on some of the other buffalo in the bushes. They're slowly coming out, so we might actually get to see one. Um, and then they try and dislodge them, like what we're witnessing now. You see that? Look how perfect that branch is, getting underneath there. And ticks, of course, like warm spots. So that would be a perfect area. And I bet there are lots and lots of ticks. Quite a clever buffalo, in fact, by doing this. Then also rolling in mud, which that buffalo has done too, will often suffocate the ticks. And they'll die that way. So they've got lots and lots of different ways to try and combat the parasites, but they do heavily rely on the ox pickers. You've just seen this boy, he completely stripped the tree. I wonder if this fella's going to do the same thing now. Much smaller buffalo. And you, can you see that? Look at all that bark that's torn off of that tree that the buffalo is now eating. That was created from the first bull. He did that. He almost broke that entire tree. So not only is it the elephants pushing the trees down, it's the buffalo too. Look at that, eating the cambium layer. So that's the layer of nutrient, uh, the, the layer where nutrients are transported from the leaves to the roots. But we'll sit here with this herd of buffalo and watch all the cool things unfold. Brent has found that carcass. Well, this is a piece of a carcass. There's actually been a monumental battle here because there's a bit of a, looks to be an Anyala's liver. So if we come across here, the leopard dragged the Anyala underneath this little bush here. And you can have a look. You can see he probably had it tucked in right there. You can see where there's some stomach content. And then hyenas have arrived and stolen the carcass. Now, it is very, very fresh. I mean, you can see there's not even rigor in the tail. And it looks like a little Anyala tail. Um, I'd say it's very early this morning, so even if I put my hands in the blood over there, that's how fresh it is. The blood hasn't even dried. Dave, come here, Dave. <laughs> okay, now, we're pretty sure he spotted us and he moved off. Uh, he, he's not as relaxed as some of the other leopards on foot. So I'm just going to try and show you what little bit of the carcass he did manage to stash. We can't see how much of it is. 
And Steve's about to arrive now. So let's just go this way. He managed to put some of it just out of hyena's grasp. I'm not sure. We, we heard some birds alarming just behind. So he's not so comfortable with people on foot. So we're not going to spend too much time here. Steve's on his way. And I've actually got a present for Steve. Dave, you just keep filming that leg there. Maybe you'll spot him. He could be even lying right underneath it. Lara is wondering, is it safe to touch the blood of an animal? It is, Lara. It, it is safe. I'm touching it now. Now, Steve's a vegetarian, but we're going to offer this to Steve for breakfast. I think Steve might have spotted the leopard. Oh, there's more meat. Oh, it seems like he's... So, the, he's stashed the meat in different places. So, there's more meat up there. So, he had a big fight with the hyenas from the tracks. But let's go see Steve. Hi Steve, are you having a good morning? Ah, some more meat. It, it looks like a big, I, I think it, either in Yala or Kudu, but they had a big fight with the hyenas. And we've got something for you for breakfast, because you know you're such a meat lover. Mm. And you like some liver. <laughs> <laughs> Come on Brent, I think you to eat that. Oh no, I'm not that silly. There's been hyenas on it. <laughs> but if if I was actually having to survive out here in the bush, this would actually be a really good find. Um, I would cook it thoroughly first, but I could definitely eat this. And if I was surviving, I'd also steal the meat from the leopard. But fortunately, Amanda cooks for us. Maybe we should take this back to camp and see if Amanda will cook it for Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Senzo, do you want some liver? Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, yes. yeah. uh, Steve and I are going to try to figure out where this leopard's gone. Steve's going to go check there. I'm going to move out of the area as Hukumuri's not the most relaxed male on foot. Um, hopefully while Steve's driving around, he'll have a bit of better luck. Um, Dove, do you want it? Okay, well, we're going to send you across the tailor in the meantime. <laughs> we are watching some very cool behavior with these buffalo at the moment. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you eat any buffalo liver. <laughs> but, so we've obviously been talking about how animals rid themselves of parasites. But I've only ever seen it a few times where they'll actually rub up against a tree and open up the bark and try and get that all over their horns, around their ears and on their neck, as if they're sort of dipping themselves with a, well, I suppose dip that gets rid of fleas and ticks and mites and all sorts of things. And quite cool to see because every single buffalo that came past went to that tree. And you can see how they've completely torn it up now. Look at that. Amazing. I'm not sure what tree it is. It might be a wisteria tree. In fact, I'm just having a look at the leaves, but I'm also not sure. Hmm. Oh, and, and Louise in uh, Final Control said she's never seen the buffalo actually eating the bark. Well, I suppose there's many different medicinal properties and the animals know what's right from wrong. Uh, a lot of people don't actually realize that 5% of a buffalo's diet is actually browsing. So even though there are bulk grazers, they can and when they need to, they will eat leaves. They particularly are fond of the round leaf teak. Can you see some more, Craig? They've gone into the thicket. A bit hot, you've got a little bit, just sort of see the trees moving around. So they might eat a little bit of bark every now and then. Off they go, hidden just behind a little small shrub of sorts. Very cool though. Thanks, Buffalo. That was quite nice. Yeah, they've all disappeared. I reckon they're probably going to at some point head towards Twin Dams. Maybe they'll have a wallow around there, nice and out in the open, have a little swim. Was so cool to see. I haven't seen that for a very, very long time, right? But I bet you're all getting sick of hearing the sound of my voice and you'd much rather see a leopard. So let's go to Steve. Yes, look what we found. We've just moved into 
uh, underneath the marula tree and look at what Brent and, and Herbie have managed to get us into. Um, whatever it is that was killed, it seems to have been a kudu, but the look he's giving, that is the look he's giving Brent and the bushwalk team to basically say, Oi, don't you come near my meat, boys. He's not too bothered with me knowing I'm a vegetarian, but he knows Brent will eat anything to survive. And it does look like Hukumuri. Nick, am I right in saying that? He's got those really, really sort of... Uh, <laughs> he's got that scar on the face, and he's got those eyes. I know this cat. I didn't know him very well a moment ago because he was lying very flat, just with his ears above and his eyes, looking straight at the bushwalk team that were only about 40 yards or so from him. But he's not far from the kill in the tree, and it's possible that he lost bits and pieces to the hyena, and the noises we heard earlier were probably uh, from those hyena and hukumuri interacting. But no hyena on the scene. Very hard to say what actually happened. But marvellous. Good morning, sir. Thank you for showing yourself to us on this morning. We're still watching as the bushwalk team departs the scene. Absolutely fantastic. So you can see, folks, how important it is for us to have radio communication. Uh, the bushwalk team was able to find the, cr si the, the, the crime scene. Uh, Senzo spotted the meat in the tree here because he is a meat eater. He sees meat from a, a mile away. And, uh, and there we go. We just go in and underneath the tree, and there is a beautiful male leopard. <laughs> Sherry, yes, Brent does smell like liver now. <laughs> and I, I wonder, and I'll get back to you all later, whether he does take that piece of liver back for breakfast. It would not surprise me in the least. <laughs> he said he's eaten a terrapin before, which I think is unbelievable. Ray, who is currently viewing us, he's in FC with Nix. He wants to know if the panting increases his sense of, of smell. Ray, the scent of smell of leopards is phenomenal, but the panting is to help him cool down as well as because he's got a, probably a full belly of meat that's pushing up against his diaphragm, and so that's causing him to pant a little bit more. I'm going to just move up, see if we can get him before he disappears. Just bear with me. I don't know where he's going to. He's moving away from the kill. Maybe he's going to go find himself a better piece of shade. He is uh, not seemingly following the bushwalk team, kind of walking in a similar direction. Um, maybe he wants his liver back, Brent. Maybe he wants to come and challenge you for what you have stolen. But he's going straight towards an African weeping wattle, which we know out here is the beautiful shade of the African wilderness. And we have had many a leopard and a lion enjoying the shade of these African weeping wattles because oh, there he is. Let me just get around him. We'll go again with that, Nick. Something about big cats. Ah, oh, there he is. <laughs> Ash wants to know if big cats cough up fur balls, hair balls like house cats. Well, yes, they do. Um, they groom themselves, so they lick themselves with the fur. Uh, they get a lot of their fur in their throat or in their stomach, and they can't digest that. But also, when they feed, they get quite a lot of, lot of fur in their in their in their uh, feeding. And lions and leopards will cough up fur balls every now and again, and they'll chew some grass beforehand, which will allow them to sort of vomit. And in lion, uh, in lion vomit, you'll find fur, you'll find hooves, you'll find bones, because there's absolutely no, uh, what should I say, pacing themselves when lions feed. They just eat and devour absolutely everything. A leopard has a little bit more time and will pluck a lot of the fur out of the animals that they feed on, but that still doesn't mean they get all the fur out. So yes, they will cough up fur balls from time to time, because uh, they're not able to digest it. So folks, we're going to stay with him. I'm just going to call in on the radio for anybody else who'd like to see Hukumuri. If you just stand by with me. Stations we've relocated on Hukumuri, on Shibamu, just off on the western side from the pan. One station unlock. I have no doubt there will be some interest.
Kobe Josia Amis got a kill in the Marula, visible from the pan, just on the western side. Uh, he's now moved off a little bit. He's probably about 100 meters from the road, lying up. I uh, will leave a branch in the road uh, for anybody who's interested when I leave. Yeah, that's affirmative at the split of the road, coming into uh, Wurtello itself from the two pans at the split road, just north of that on the western side. Okay, so we go to reposition and we're going to go over to Taylor for an update. We had a auto. Let's see if he's going to stay. There he is. He was out in the road. He was being quite nice. He's munching away on grass. Grasses at the moment, I presume, pretty much what the guinea fowl were feeding on this morning, the grass seeds, because he was holding his head quite high up. Off he goes. Older boy. Ah. Oh. No, he doesn't want to be seen anymore. It was quite nice, though, to see a warthog. One that didn't have its tail in the air and racing away from me because that's normally the view that you see. Again, a short and sweet sighting. That's good. All these mud wallows along uh, Ingwe Alley seem to be drying up. So I'm a little bit disappointed that we didn't get much rain at all. A pity. Uh, it did rain quite a bit between here and Hoodsprate. Lots of puddles on the road. But... And just, just missed us. Mm. So, animals better get in quick. <laughs> and lots of algae also forming in the water. We need uh, some fresh stuff to get rid of it all, to top them all up. Okay, well, I'm still looking for my elephants. Haven't found them yet this morning. So, might go pop past Weyotela Dam to see if there are any around. I'm going to send you back across to Steve, though, who's just finding all the cats today. Yes, thanks, Taylor. We've got Hukumori again, and his belly is looking rather full of what we think is kudu. So now, next, if you want to tell Taylor that we had some elephant there at Treehouse Dam and on the road to Treehouse Dam from Twin Dams, she might be able to find some ellies there if she's interested. We were racing here to try and assist, and we were successful in finding this beautiful male leopard who is definitely making Juma his home. Super excited to find him again because I haven't seen him in, in about a week. What are you up to, boy? I'm sure Herbie and Brent have moved off. I hope so, anyway. What is Hukumori up to? Maybe the hyena are still around? Definitely interested in whatever. Mario would like to know if anyone's seen Hukumori up a tree. I have not myself, personally. Sens, have you seen him up a tree? Senzo hasn't. Um, I haven't seen him up a tree, Mario, myself. Senzo hasn't. I wonder if, if Taylor or one of the other presenters, Nix is trying to think back. She's actually doing a very nice safari life story on Hukumori, and none of the footage has him in a tree. But, I mean, that kudu kill is in a tree, so he definitely was in there. We just haven't seen him in there. He's quite a ground-dwelling cat, it seems. But he is beautiful. Where are you going, boy? Look at him, eh? So much more powerful than the female we were with before. You just look at the shoulders and the neck. He's a leopard in his prime. I have no doubt hyenas will give him away. Marvellous. It's just so marvellous we're able to watch these cats do what they do in the wild. For those of you who are new to the show, please bear in mind these lions, these, these leopards are absolutely wild. There's nothing tame about them. They've just become very used to and habituated to the vehicles, which allows us to see and to spend time with them like this. But if I had to get out of the vehicle and walk towards him, there would be a very different response. 
Patrick, you'd like to know if a lone hyena would try face down Hukumuri. Really, what I've experienced in the past is that you get sort of leopards that have a, a rapport with hyena, and big male leopards generally are left alone by a single hyena. If there's a group of them, they might chase them up the tree, but quite often the reputation of the leopard will precede itself, and the hyena will know who it is, and it'll be like, hang on, why is he being so confident? And they'll often just sit there and have a stare off without having to come any closer. Well, as he moves around the bush, let's move around. So I think personally that Hukumuri would stand off a, a, an individual hyena. We go back, eh, Sins? Okay, Sins, I reckon we go back this way. We might get another view of him coming around. Oh, Jamie uh, has seen him up a tree on the dam cam a while ago, chased by hyenas. Oh, sorry, spider. Little spider web there, apologies. Where has he gone to? There we go, he's walking away. Let's see if we can get around here. Lisa wants to know how old Hukumuri is. We don't really know. We're estimating he's between the ages of five and seven. Um, he comes from further south in the Sabi Sands, apparently, but then a lot more information has come to light that he's actually been spotted at Crocodile Bridge in the Kruger National Park. He's been spotted in, in Angala, which is in sort of the Timavati area. Um, and that was three. Oh, there's a hyena right here. There's a hyena right here on my right hand side. And he's got a little something in his mouth. It's just coming around. There we go. Hello, cheeky. Hello, cheeky. I wonder if Hukumuri is going to come and discipline this hyena. The hyena is not too, too fussed, but he's walking in the complete opposite direction to Hukumuri, who seemed to be sort of fanning around in this direction. Let's see if we can catch him. I don't want him to disappear. Oh, sorry, Senzi. Sorry about that. Okay, keep your eyes peeled. He's just in here somewhere. No doubt he was giving that hyena an evil eye. Let's have a little look in there, Senzi. This is what we have to work with, folks. I mean, a leopard who wants to disappear will disappear. I mean, think about that. If you were walking here, we know he's there. We know he's somewhere here. If you were walking here, you would have no idea that he's there. I mean, Brent and Herbie and them hadn't seen him. If it wasn't for us driving in with the vehicle, uh, we he wouldn't have seen him. Okay, so let's go to Brent who's walking back to camp while we try and find this cat. Wow, what a wonderful first bush walk back. Some flowers, a spider I've never seen before, and uh, of course a new leopard on foot. So I got to see him on foot as we were walking away there. So it was really, really nice. He was down like this, just staring at us. I think he was actually staring at Darby, who smells a bit funky this morning. Uh, but a lot of you are probably wondering, why has Brent still got the kudu's tail? Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm a fly fisherman. And uh, you don't get opportunities to get good quality, um, as it was, it's called in the fly fishing world, bucktail like this. And uh, so I can create some flies from this kudu tail. And uh, I think... I'm going to actually have to name a, a creation. I'm going to make a new type of fly today, and I'm going to have to call it a kudu or hukumuri. Let's go. Ah, actually, that's a brilliant name for a fly. I'm going to make a hukumuri. So I'm going to make a hukumuri today, and uh, I'll bring it on drive on this afternoon so you can have a look what I created out of what hukumuri left behind. So, so we've got some nice white, some good black, and some nice sort of black and tan. This would be very good for clouser minnows, those of you who, uh, who are saltwater fly fishermen. This would be excellent for clouser minnows. So what I'm going to have to do now is when I get back, is when I get a sharp knife and I'm going to cut down the center here. So you can see there's still there. So I'll cut down the center there and then remove what's left of the tail. See there's, a bo there's still bone and stuff in here and, and, and gristle. So what I'll do is I'll cut that, remove that, um, raid Amanda's kitchen for some rock salt, <laughs> salt it, 
dry it, but I'm going to make a, a fly <laughs> as, uh, as out of this today so I can bring it on drive. Okay, so while I consider what creation the hookamuri is going to be, uh, and that is the fly, not the leopard, uh, let's go see how Madame McCurdy's morning is faring. Well, it's been up, it's been down, but it's back up again, Brent. <laughs> Good luck with all your your fishing things. Um, so I've never seen Craig cry before until this morning. And I had to pass him some tissues, you know, give him a pat on the back and comfort him. And the reason why he's so sad this morning is because he only arrived back at work at the end of marula season. He's de absolutely devastated. So there's a marula tree. And sadly, there aren't many that are still dropping fruit. There's one or two, so we'll have to see this afternoon if we can find a couple. I also haven't had many. And I just think it's just been an amazing morning just with the way that the weather has changed. Obviously, we started our drive off. It was very gloomy and cloudy and grey. But now look how it's turned out to beautiful blue sky. It's lovely. <laughs> Now, Swapna, you're wondering if uh, myself or the rest of the crew ever prank each other. Yes, we love it. We do it often, in fact. Um, Brent scares me all the time. He normally manages to catch me out that way. Um, I've got a prank that I want to play on James at some point, but I'm not going to say it now because I've told some of you already and you're not allowed to tell him that. And he also might be sitting in the Mara watching me. So we'll keep that a secret. But James... Just you wait till we work to we're we'll in the same location again. Uh, so yeah, we do. I like to tell big stories. So I try to catch people out. I you can imagine spin the most ridiculous stories ever and then see if people will believe me. I love meeting new people because then they don't know me and they don't know to take me seriously. So they're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I think I read about that. Just made it up. Uh, so I do that to people. We played the game all the time. I don't know what this game is called, but you all know what I'm talking about, where you have to catch someone else. You do that, and if they look at it, I think you can do that. I, I don't know the point of the game, but that happens all the time in camp. Um, hi, Impala. I, this is what I'm thinking. Nikki's going, does this game have a name? And I was like, I have no idea, but it's the game. Everybody knows it. Everybody plays it all over the world. And so we do that often. And lovely heard of Impala here. So, so yeah, I'm trying to think what else we do. Hmm, I don't know. We've done a cup. We've done a couple of things. We definitely do a couple of things. They've just, uh, I've forgotten them. But we we do. We tease each other like brother and sister, all the time in camp. So you you never quite know what to expect. But one last view of the Impala, of course, until the sunset safari, where I'm sure we'll see some more. So for myself and Craig. It was great to have you, but I'm going to send you across to Stivovo to end the show. Yes, thank you, folks. We've managed to find him again. Sorry, I'm just moving. We've got a vehicle coming in to, to join us. I'm just trying to direct him in so that he can see it. And they can get a view of him. He's just underneath the, the African weeping wattle here. He's keeping a very close eye on whatever those hyenas were doing. It's kind of done a big circle coming back towards where Brent had that scene of the crime. And he's an absolutely marvelous specimen, Hukumuri. See how flat he is when he lifts his head above that branch. He's almost invisible. Almost invisible. He's trying to, to, to keep himself very well concealed in the shade. Okay, so we've got the other vehicle in here, marvelous. We managed to move a little bit forward, so they're also able to see it. Fantastic. I mean, it's just off the road, folks. You would you'd be driving. It's probably like 15 meters off the road. We followed him back across the road. You would not see this leopard if you did not know he was there. So we wonder how many times driving around we just miss leopards. Um, and that's why it is so important to be able to track, to be able to d discern the difference between a fresh track and an old track. And so what would happen this afternoon, because uh, when I drove across uh, the road here and Brent was walking away, he's now come across the road and actually stepped on the tracks that we had. So that would have indicated very, very freshness and would have been made us able to find him later this afternoon. Janine wants to know, is there any part of the animal the leopard can't eat? Well, Janine, they struggle with the really heavy bones. 
Hyenas are able to break the very heavy bones, but they also don't feed on too much of the hide. They might feed on the softer bits of the skin, but they, as we saw this morning with the Dacre, they really enjoy the cheeks, the internal organs, and they won't feed on the stomach content. They might squeeze the, the stuff out of the intestines and feed on that, but they'll leave the very strong, heavy bones, maybe even the hooves. But if it's a small animal, like a baby in parlor or a baby waterbuck, leopards could actually eat the entire thing, skin, bones, everything. So it really just depends on the age and the strength of, of the animal and the sort of the calcifications of those bones so what an amazing morning we have had thank you brent and herbie and dave for finding the scene of the crime in hukumuri we went from the ingrid dam or the shadulu female and what a marvelous morning we had of her feeding buffalo elephant it's been marvelous out here the sun is coming up we've had a cool morning it's going to be a wonderful afternoon we're going to come back later today see if we can find hukumuri Thank you for all of those joining us on Safari. We'll see you again this afternoon from FC and all the team. Thank you and have a beautiful afternoon.